right. Hello and welcome to the uh, 2020 E-Rate What's New for 2020 webinar. Um, this is our annual training and update for E-Rate. I am Krista Porter. I am the Library Development Director here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, one of my duties as Library Development Director is um, I am also the State E-Rate Coordinator for Public Libraries in Nebraska. So that means I do the consulting and training and handholding and anything else you may need um, as you are going through your E-Rate present uh, applications um, and anything that goes along with that. I have been doing E-Rate since 2009. Uh, originally did start out uh, with training in, in 2009 and submitting the application for the Nebraska Library Commission. So I have been through the same thing that you guys are all going through with E-Rate. Um, we are going to go through some of the basics of the program today and then get in some details of some of the forms so that you can see how uh, some of this will work and hopefully um, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, today, things will be, uh, information we have today will be useful to anyone who has, um, is brand new to E-Rate. If you've never done it before, you're just wondering what it's all about, we'll have all the basics about for that, um, as well as people who have done E-Rate in the past. This is uh, something that uh, you can potentially benefit from having a refresher on. Uh, it does take some learning to do, some practice, uh, but we will get everyone through um, the process here today. So, just checking one more thing here. All right. All right, so we are going to start with the very basics. What is E-Rate? Uh, E-Rate is a federal program that gives discounts on um, bills and costs for schools and uh, for for K-12 schools and public libraries to get discounts on telecommunications and internet costs. So this would be your monthly internet bill, um, any upgrades, wiring, uh, equipment, anything else that you might have to do that has to do with your um, internet connection. Uh, this is something that started out in, as part of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 uh, was where this was um, set up that this was something that the um, FCC and the government needed, realized they needed to do is to help schools and libraries to afford the increasing costs of um, internet and telecommunications. Uh, the first year you could apply was in 1998. So that's how long this has been uh, going. We have many libraries I know here in Nebraska that have been doing it from the very beginning, and that's great. Uh, the money that is in the program is funded through what they call the universal service fee. Um, this is something that the companies that provide um, your services to you, your, tele your telecommunication companies, your internet service provider, and you pay into. Uh, if you look on any of the bills that you have for your phone or your internet, you will see something called sometimes a USF charge, universal service fee, it might be, you know, abbreviated some other way. Um, but this is one of the many fees and taxes that we all pay. And it goes into a pot of money that is then available to be divided up amongst the schools and libraries who apply for the discount. So it is run by the FCC, uh, the Federal Communications Commission. They oversee the entire program. They set all the rules and policies and how it is all going to work. And then it is, they created this company, the Universal Service Administrative Company, which is a non-for-profit company that is responsible for um, running the actual program. They're who you will hear from when you um, are submitting your application, we have questions, all of those things. There are also a couple of other programs they run for hospitals and healthcare facilities, for low-income people, and for people in high-cost areas. Uh, so uh, there are multiple places that this money is uh, div divided up amongst. Um, E-rate is an um, abbreviation, uh, unofficial abbreviation for education rate, being for the, the specific part of the program that's for schools and libraries, providing educational type resources. And within USAC, there's a schools and libraries division that is the part, the people that we sp directly um, deal with as far as being a school and a public library. Uh, now, who can apply for E-Rate? Uh, libraries and library system, the only requirement that E-Rate, that USAC has for it is that you must be eligible
eligible for LSTA funding. This is Library Service and Technology Act funding. funding. Um, this is determined differently um, state by state. Each state is given the authority, their state library agency, which here in Nebraska is us at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, they are given the authority to decide what that means, um, what is the definition of being eligible. So it varies from state to state. Here in Nebraska, we have decided that we do provide many services to all libraries in the state that you are eligible to receive. So you are then receiving um, LSTA funding in kind of a trickle-down theory. <laughs> uh, so in Nebraska, all public libraries are eligible to apply. In other states, it will be different. So if you are watching this either you know today, I know we have some people today or on a recording somewhere, and you're not from Nebraska, you need to check with your own state to see what the requirements are there. This is done as a, on a state-by-state thing. Um, also schools and school districts are, available, are eligible and if we had consortia groups of schools and libraries getting together. Um, here in Nebraska we have divided up the um, support for E-rate. Public libraries come to me at the Nebraska Library Commission for their training and education and our schools go to someone who, who is at our Department of Education. Uh, so we have split up the E-rate duties, the E-rate support and training duties and cons consultation. In other states, it's different. Some In other states, you may have the same person that does both of these things. So um, once again, check with your own state if you're not in Nebraska for who you need to contact for more um, help and support with uh, doing your E-rate application. So E-rate works on a funding year. Uh, commitments are made, as they say, from July 1st through June 30th of a year. So when you are working on your E-rate application right now, which you can start uh, right now with um, the first step in the process that we'll get into, uh, you are looking for something in the future. You're looking to say, I want to receive my E-rate funding starting in July of next year. So um, we are now working on applying for what they call the funding year 2020, 2020 funding, funding year, which runs from July 1st, 2020 through June 30th of 2021. <clears throat> right now we are in the 2019 funding year, which libraries applied for last year. Um, in, in 2018 for 2019 through 2020. Um, you'll, you'll get used to the process and how it works for the funding years. So you're always, whenever you're thinking about e you're always thinking into the future. Uh, it is not something where you can say, oh, I had these bills and I want to get a re dis my re um, discount money back. I want to get a reimbursement on something I already paid for or something I already bought. It doesn't work like that. You're always thinking to the future, that we are going to be needing to spend this money next year and we want to get a discount on it when it comes up. So that's what we are um, working towards. There is almost $4 billion available. Um, a fish, um, as a minimum each year, and they do adjust that annually. This year, I know they did um, up the amount that was going to be available due to inflation. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. It's now four point something billion if you look for the official amount that's out there. But there's plenty of money to go around to everybody. We just need to, you just need to apply for it. Now, the first thing I tell libraries to look at when they are thinking about doing e rate is what is your discount? Um, how much of a discount can you receive at your library um, to see if it is worth it? Is it worth your time and effort and energy to go through applying for all of this? So discounts are uh, calculated based on um, a couple of different things. Uh, you can receive anywhere from 20 to 90 percent off on your bills, and it will depend on the number of children who are eligible for the school lunch program um, in your school district. So this is the free and reduced lunches that the kids get in school. Uh, it is specifically the school district that your library physically sits in, resides in, where your building is. Now you may provide services to children from other school districts that are not the one that your library actually is geographically in, and that's okay. Um, as far as E-rate is concerned, they just look at you know, where you're located to figure out this um, calculation. Uh, there are lots of different ways that uh, poverty level can be determined, and E-rate wanted to make sure the most discounts get to the most the, the, the poorer areas in the country. And this is just one criteria that they decided to pick for their purposes. So you'd have to look and see what is your school district that your library building sits in, and find out the numbers for that. Uh, Note here, you can include pre-K, only kindergarten, K through 12. And then they combine that whether you're considered urban or rural. Here in Nebraska, we are mostly rural, which is actually a good thing because they do get a slightly higher discount in some things um, by being in a rural area. 
So we can very easily actually look up all of this information here in Nebraska. On the Nebraska's Department of Education website, they post their school lunch numbers every year. So you can go to this link here um, and you will find spreadsheets going back multiple years. You just look at the current year, you find your school district. There's multiple tabs in this spreadsheet. They've got every single individual school listed, but there's a tab that's just the school district as a whole. And that's the one you want to go to because you want all of the schools that might be in your district, whether they are the elementary, middle, high school, however your district is broken up. Um, and you find the, the number in there and they have it very, um, it's very useful for us. It tells you how many kids, children are enrolled in the school and how many of them are eligible for the school lunch program and then what that percentage is and that's the number you need is that percentage and something that's key here that I want to mention is this is the number of students that are eligible for the program not necessarily all the ones that apply because that number can be different not every family who is eligible for the national school lunch program does apply for it some of them figure you know we're fine we can, we don't need the the help we are able to cover our children's lunches on our own and that's great uh, some of them don't apply due to the the perceived stigma of baby being in the program so um, they may not apply but that's okay because what you're looking for is just how many might be eligible for it which is definitely going to be a higher number than what who who may potentially apply um, this is also something that is very important too. In the past, we have had some uh, pushback from our schools uh, about not wanting to give out this information because it was a privacy concern and that you know, people would then know which children were in the program. We don't need to know which children are in the program. There's nothing that passes through that has anything to do with who they are, or where they live, anything like that. All it is is numbers, and it's just numbers that are eligible and that we're applying. So there's really no way of matching it up with who any of these children were. Um, in the past, it was a struggle for here in Nebraska for people to for libraries to get this information by calling the schools, calling the school district, finding the numbers. Um, but at some point in the past, the Department of Education decided we're just posting all of it on our website so you do no longer have to contact the school, call them, go through the right people to find out who even knows these numbers, um, you know, to explain to anybody why you're asking for these numbers and what E-rate is or anything. You just go to that um, spreadsheet and you find yours. Then um, USAC has posted up a tool a website where you can look up your urban or rural status, find out what you are. Um, it's based right now on 2010 census data, the most recent complete census. Uh, at some point after next year's census, that will be updated. That's a future thing, but for now, this is what they're working with. And the, the cutoff between urban and rural, um, as far as the FCC is concerned, is a population of 25,000. So that's where you go on either side of it. And then, once you have those two numbers, there is this candy dandy little discount matrix that USEC provides, where you can look up and see, based on the percentage of children that are eligible for the school lunch program, what um, discount um, a library can receive. And now you see here we have category one and category two, and I'll get into explaining the difference between those. There's different types of things um, that you can apply for in E-Rate. Uh, but you can see here from this matrix that even having less than 50% of your children eligible, you can still get 60 to 70% off on your E-Rate eligible cost. So this is your monthly internet bill. Any equipment you need to buy to make your internet work, routers, switches, uh, wireless access points, cabling, all of that. So um, it's a pretty good deal. Here in Nebraska, most of our libraries fall between 60 to 80%. Uh, we have a few in the 90, a few lower, but almost most of them fall into that area. So you can get a pretty, pretty good discount here. So this is something definitely to look into to see, you know, is it something that we um, want to go through. E-rate can be a complex process. It's a, something you keep up with throughout the year, um, but if you're going to be getting 60, 70, 80 percent off on your bills, it might definitely be worth it. All right, so eligible services list. What can you get an E-rate discount on? What is E-rateable? as I say. I don't know if that's a real word, but it works here. <laughs> um, every year, there is a new list that is published of what you can receive an E-rate discount on. The FCC publishes what they call their um, ESL eligible services list. They post them all up on their website. 
uh, and you can see um, every year going back to the very beginning what was eligible each year. Uh, because there is a new list published every year, you do have to make sure you're working from the correct one whenever you're doing your application. So you're you know, applying for the things that are actually eligible this year. Uh, generally, those things don't usually change very much. Most of the time it's clarifications maybe in a new year of what, you know, if something was a little confusing last year, let's spill it out a little better this year. Um, so uh, make sure you're you know, using the right list when you're applying. Um, I did mention that you are currently, if you are applying for ERA right now, you're applying for 2020, but we're in the 2019 year. So you may still be wrapping up some things related to 2019 funding year. So if there are questions from USAC or things you want to look up, make sure you're looking at the right list that matches up with whatever year you might be working on at the time, depending on what you're doing for your process. Um, yeah. Okay, so there are, um, as it says in the previous uh, slide there, there are two different categories of services, things that you can apply for E-rate discounts for. Uh, services providing category, um, providing con the connection to the building is category one, and anything providing connection within the building is category two. So category one would be your monthly internet bill. How, how do you get the internet to your library in the first place? What are you subscribing to? Um, is it a cable connection? Is it DSL? Who's your service provider? What you're getting? Once you get it to the building, then how do you get it to all the different devices is category two. Do you have routers and switches and cables to your um, hardwired computers in, in your library and in your computer lab? Uh, wireless access points that put out the Wi-Fi. All of that is category two. Um, a good way to think about the difference between these is the wall of your walls of your building is in between each of these. Category one is bringing the service to the building. Category two is once it's within the walls of the building, how is it getting um, spread out to all of the different devices that need to access it? And category one is basically anything that can get high speed broadband internet to your library. And this is not an exhaustive list of things. This is just some of the most common ones. Uh, uh, cable modem, DSL, fiber, uh, satellite, wireless service. Now in this case, wireless means the wire wirelessly getting the internet to the library, not the fact that you have Wi-Fi within the library. That's that's something separate. So this is how you get the connection, get your internet to your building in the first place. Um, a little uh, explanation of fiber, because they do mention both lit and dark fiber. Um, fiber is something that um, many locations are getting and inst um, having installed, construction being done, putting it in. Some places don't have it yet, that's true, but if you do have it, um, it is something that you can connect to, find a service provider who is offering fiber. Uh, they, you then um, sign up with them to have that be your connection. Uh, now, when the fiber lines were first laid in many places, you know, trenches were dug and lots of fiber was put in, they put in more than was needed at the time for, for services, hopeful, hoping that there would be an increase in, in, in need in, in uh, that people wanting to have more connections and, and sub subscribe to it. So they put in more than they needed and you can contact a, a service provider who may own this dark fiber and have them turn it on for you, for your library, and then get your, then have that become lit fiber that you can then use. So there is sometimes a fee to turn that on. Uh, there might be more connect, uh, construction needed to get that dark fiber connected to where your building is, um, but that is something that you can you know, um, have access to. You just have to see if um, there's any of that in your area. Uh, and there is a little note here about that if you are looking for a dark fiber to be your solution, you must also um, request lit fiber together. There's a combo um, or a deal to request both of those free rate discounts. Um, this is just to cover all your bases, which is always a good idea. You know, don't just say we're just looking for dark because lit might already be available and you want to make sure you don't miss out on anything. So they do require if you want that to investigate and to you know, kind of reach out and see, is there any dark fiber in my area? You have to do lit along with it. Kind of makes sense anyways. Uh, something else I'm going to mention briefly here related to, um, oops, went a little too fast. Uh, sorry, special construction. I mentioned construction might need to be done. Um, if there is, if you need to have some construction done to bring that connection, whatever connection it is, whether um, 
it's new fiber to your or our dark fiber turned on um, that can also be included as a category one cost so you can find out that fiber exists but it's actually only for you know it's a few blocks away from my library or um, it's across the street you um, need some sort of construction done that cost of that construction you can apply for an e-rate discount in category one as well um, this also includes things like the design project management all those extra costs along with doing a major construction project, um, any of that can um, also receive an E-rate discount. Um, USAC also realizes that you can't necessarily make, you can't depend on your provider to be able to do this construction during just that funding year, that July through June time period. It may be they have to do it when they do it, when it's on their schedule, um, and that's fine. Um, E-rate, USAC says that as long as it's within six months before the funding year, you can still receive a discount. So even though the E-rate funding year starts on July 1st of 2020, for example, if your construction needed to be done in April or May, just because of that's when it's on their schedule, that's perfectly fine. You can still get your discount on those construction costs. Now, something that I did want to mention, um, just because you may hear about this, voice services, this is telephone, anything voice related, used to be a category one service that was um, you could get an E-rate discount on. Um, the last year to apply for this was uh, 2019, the one you're in right now. So it's, it's a past thing, it's no longer available. It was uh, used by many, many libraries, um, uh, getting a discount on your telephone uh, is part of a modernization or, um, of E-rate that the FCC dictated needed to be done. They decided they wanted to do more work to, as it says here, to close the Wi-Fi gap to get more broadband internet service out to libraries and schools. Um, so many libraries and schools are applying for voice services and there was only, as I said, there was this budget of the four, about $4 billion available. Um, there was actually, uh, E-rate was running out of money after category one was, was done and all the applications were completed and going on to category two, which is your uh, equipment and connections and upgrading, uh, there was a limited amount of money and many libraries applications were never, were unable to be funded because they used up all the money. So they wanted to make their dollars go farther. They wanted to be able to really, really support um, increasing the internet connections. So they made the decision that we are going to gradually eliminate voice services as, as receiving discounts. Um, they did it gradually through over a five year period um, until um, as of last year, the last libraries were able to get only about 10, only 10 off on their phone bill. This year it's not available. Uh, it, it has been a hardship for many libraries and school districts. We know it was a very um, big amount of a discount they got, but it is working as far as what FCC wanted to do, which was have money to be able to fund more applications that are related to internet. Uh, since they did make this change, there's now been enough money to fund everything. They did not have to cut off, cut off on any of the, of the applications for category two. So that's a good thing. Uh, it's, uh, struggle for many schools and libraries, mainly the larger ones, um, having who have so many phone lines, but even our small and rural libraries, when you're getting 80, 70% off on a phone bill and suddenly you're not, that is um, a problem. But this is the change that the FCC has decided to go to with. There was uh, comments made, you know, there's an official process, the FCC puts out a rule, then anyone who wants to can make an official comment, their opinion on it. Uh, that came from various groups uh, saying that they didn't think this was a good idea, but since it is doing what the FCC wanted as far as being able to uh, fund so all the applications that come in for internet, this is going to be the state of things from now forward. So, so that is our category one. Any questions about category one before I go on to category two? You can type into your questions section anytime you have a question, and I can see it here and grab it. Um, and answer any questions you have. So anything, any questions about what we've talked about so far? All right, well, if you do have anything, I'll keep an eye on that and um, answer your question. So category two, this is the equipment and services once you've got your internet connection coming to your building. How do you get it throughout your library? This is your internal connections. That is all the equipment as I mentioned, routers, wires, cabling, all that. Uh, managed internal broadband services, a newish way of getting your internet that I'll explain in a bit, and maintenance of your internal connections. 
So you need to have any repairs, upgrading, any of that done to your equipment in your library. So these are the, so some of the things you're eligible under Category 2. So your um, access points, cables, firewalls, uh, routers, racks, uh, wireless access points, uh, power supplies, um, and then any sort of improvements or upgrades that need to be done um, that have to do with your internet connection. And software is mentioned here, and I'll, specif I'll be, you know, specify about that. This is software related to running your network, some software related to getting your um, internet working. So um, not discounts like we have Microsoft Word on our computers or anything like that, but any networking software that you might have that makes your internet run. Uh, managed internal broadband services is also called managed Wi-Fi. Um, this is something where a third party runs everything for you. Uh, traditionally, you get a service from your service provider and then you keep track of it and maintain it and make sure everything's working. Sometimes contact the provider for updates or, or fixes and things. Um, but this is something you can totally turn it over to a third party and you really have nothing to do with it except for um, paying. So if you are do have some sort of that situation available to you, that can also be of it. Um, um, eligible to receive funding. Um, and then the basic maintenance that I mentioned. So repair, um, anything breaks, anything needs to be replaced, anything just needs upgrading, your usual upgrading, uh, configuration updates, uh, software updates that need to be done, um, tech support, anything like that that needs to be done um, to your, anything that, that makes sure your internet works, you can get a discount on. Um, now, the way this works is you actually need to have some sort of a contract with someone ahead of time. Uh, this may be your service provider themselves that provides this. Uh, it may be a separate company, um, independent company, someone in your community that provides this service. Um, and then you say you're going to have this available, uh, and then whenever it is needed and they do the work, then you can get a discount on it. So um, if you are paying, for example, a monthly fee, you know, I don't know if this is accurate, but like $20 a month to have them on call. That $20 a month is not eligible um, every, for every month, but if like three months in, uh, Squirrel uh, chews through your cable and you need to have someone come and repair it and there's a cost for that work that was done, then that work is what you can get your discount on. Uh, there's also some other things that can be eligible. Uh, these are all the extra fees. There's, you know, there's your basic fee for everything, and then of course you have taxes and surcharges and things. Uh, even the universal service fee that I mentioned that you pay into the program, you can get a discount on that. So uh, when you're asking for your, your discount, when you do your application forms here, you do tell USAC this is how much it's costing me. Make sure you include all of these taxes and fees in the total of what it's costing you, not just your regular cost. If there are any charges related to, um, if you're getting equipment and there's shipping charges, training related, that, that is included. Training would be training related to teaching any of your staff how to use the network equipment. Do you need to send them to training so that they know how to run the network or how to upgrade the network? Those kind of training workshops would be eligible. Um, and then any sort of installation and configuration that might be done of any of this equipment. Um, as, as a note here, this is something new, so something to be aware of, that previously when you purchased the equipment in the first place, you had to have something in place, some, something, some, you know, the, the, what is what's going to happen for the installation had to be included in that original purchase. Now you can have someone else install it if you want to. Um, so you can buy your router from your service provider, have somebody else install it, and both of those things can get a discount. Uh, or typically your provider handles that for you, um, but it does vary. All right. Okay. Now, to figure out, some libraries do have concerns and uh, difficulty figuring out what they need. Uh, what um, do do I need to upgrade? What do I need to purchase to make my internet work? Uh, the IMLS, Institute of Museum and Library Services, uh, funded this uh, toolkit to be created toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit is what it's called, to help you figure out what you have for your broadband, what you have as equipment, and what you can do, um, what you might need to purchase to upgrade it. Uh, this is free, it's open source. We have a link to it on our E-Rate website, but here's also the direct link to the webpage about it. Uh, you can start off doing a technology inventory, which is great for many of our uh, libraries who you don't know what you even have. Uh, there's some some computer closet over there and I don't know what's in it and I don't know how it all works 
uh, I let someone else handle that, you can do an inventory here, either on your own or maybe bring in whoever is your tech person, just so you can sit down and know, understand, this is what I have, this is what we're working with right now. Um, it's all done on a question and answer type thing. You just answer questions throughout this uh, document that's available, uh, what you have, it guides you through everything. Uh, and then it gives the opportunity to do um, broadband improvement plan. Uh, that's a separate document where you can say, okay, this is what we have. We figured out from the inventory what we have. Now suggest to us what we could potentially do. And the document will help you do that. So I def highly recommend taking a look at this, seeing if it is something that could help you out. Um, even if you do think you know what's going on in your library, it's out there, it's free. Uh, use it just to maybe get a different view on what is available. So any questions yet about Category 1 or 2 services and what they entail before we move on to the next part of our workshop here? Type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface if you want any, me to answer any questions. Um, if there's anything you've been wondering about that you want to make sure that I cover, uh, type it into there too, and I'll make sure we get to it. All right, let's go on. So category two budgets. Uh, this is uh, category two, uh, how you receive your discount for category two is a little different from how you receive it from category for category one services. Category one, your basic monthly internet, uh, you just get a discount on whatever your bill costs. If, if you pay $50, $100 a month on your internet, you get your 70, 80% discount on whatever that costs. For category two, uh, USAC FCC has come up with a slightly a different way, not slightly, a different way to figure out how you can receive your money. And what they um, call this is category two budgets. What they do is they calculate a budget for your library and what, how much they think you might spend over a five year period. Now this isn't a budget in, as in the traditional sense where here's a budget and here's the money that you get to spend. This is more of a uh, imaginary, I like to think of it as, it's just, a, it's, it's just a mathematical calculation, it's just a calculation. Of they say, this is how much we think you could spend over five-year period, they do it in five-year chunks, um, for all the category two serve products and services that your library might receive. Uh, so they say, this is how much you might spend, it will give you a discount on that amount. And then what you do every year is you spend that money and you receive a reimbursement back for whatever your percentage is off. And I'll show you an example of this. Now, you do not have to limit your your costs and what you spend to just that budget they're just saying as far as e-rate is concerned this is what we will um, fund we will give you up to this amount you can go over that amount and that's fine uh, you know you may have a project that costs twenty thousand dollars for example to upgrade your computer lab uh, but e-rate says we only fund up to ten thousand and that's okay. You consider that $20,000 project, you're not stopped from it. It's just that you only receive E-rate funding and E-rate discount on half of it. So how much is your budget? The For public libraries, the discount is calculated based on the total square feet of your library. So how big is your library building? This is everything within the library walls, all floors. Uh, this is probably something you can find out uh, from your Blueprints maybe. Here in Nebraska, we do a public library, you guys <laughs> do a public library survey that you complete every year, which just went live this week, by the way. Uh, and on there, one of the questions you answer is, what is the square feet of my building? So you can just look right there and you'll find out what that number is. And then there is an amount that they multiply it by every year. It is uh, changed every year what the amount is. It goes up a few cents. We don't know yet what the number is for 2020, but in 2019, it was $2.45. It's gone per square foot. Uh, it goes up a couple of pennies every year. So for 2020, it might be to um, 47. I'm not sure when it's announced. You know, it'll be in all. It'll be in the information for E-rate. But there is a minimum of that. So two dollars and forty-five cents per square foot, but minimum of nine thousand seven hundred ninety-three dollars and four cents, which sounds like a very ridiculously <laughs> a ridiculous number a little you know, why is it just a round number uh it was originally a round um number when they first started this these five-year budgets which was the first year in 2015 
But when and then every year that amount that it multiplies by is up is raised for um, inflation is made that round number no longer a rounded number. So we just work with what the math tells us. Um, the budget can be recalculated every year if the size of your library changes. So you aren't locked into the amount you have um, for the whole five years. If you do have an expansion, hopefully your library getting bigger, not smaller. So if you are um, building a new building that is larger than your current one, and you move into it within that five years or doing an expansion or something, your budget can be recalculated in the middle of that five years and then you know, raising your minimum, you're raising your budget based on what your new size of the building is. So for an example, an actual real life example, so this, this is what helped me figure out what does this all mean? <laughs> How does this work? Your library is 3,500 square feet large. Uh, 3500 times dollars and 45 cents is 8575 but there is a minimum the $9,793.04 so uh, since that is less than the actual calculation your budget is actually the 9700 number for easy math here with a 50% discount rate the library will receive half of that in e-rate funds to spend so what they're saying is we think you could spend $9,793 over a five-year period of um, on, on category two services and we're going to give you and then we apply your discount rate to that so we'll give you the 50% in this case if you had 60 it would be 60% 70 70% and that's what we will reimburse you for over the five years um, so you can spend this money in every any way that suits your purposes. You do not have to divide it up evenly, the same amount every year in the five years. Uh, if you have a big project coming up, like you know in 2020 we're building a new library, or we're doing an expansion, or I want to upgrade everything in our computer lab, you can spend your whole budget in just the first year. And that's fine. Then you just don't have anything that you can do for the last four years of your five-year budget period. Um, or you can do things a little bit of time. If you decide, you know what, next year I want to just buy some new wireless access points. I know those are old. Uh, and I, so we just do that. What they will do, and this is in your E-rate account, they keep track of the money for you. They will deduct, once you submit your application and ask for the money, they will then deduct off of your full budget how much you spent, and then you'll know how much you have left for the other, the next four years. And then so every year you can buy something different. So the next year, maybe you update all the cab cabling. Uh, you need new routers and switchers the year after that. Whatever you need to do each year, and just gradually deducting from your, your full amount throughout those five years. So it's up to you how you um, use it and you might not even know a whole five-year plan for your library and that's okay uh, you know just start with the first year and then see what comes up over those uh, five years you have coming up any questions about the category 2 budget and how it works it is a little more confusing and, and complicated than the category 1 uh, but they do track everything for you within the system which is great if you have a question, go ahead and type it into the question section of your GoToWebinar interface, and I can answer it. I can read it from there and answer it for you. Just double checking here. No. All right. So. Uh, there, uh, you may also hear about the Category 2 pilot, budget pilot. They did, um, oh, wait, we have a, all right, someone has a question about, oh, did I, I might have a typo here in the math. Um, Oh, I might not have updated one of these to the, to the new numbers. I, I think the 4,896 is the correct number. Um, let me just... I, yeah, if we can just... Let's see. Yes. All right, so sorry about this. I updated my slides from last year and updated one of the numbers and not the other ones in here on the last bullet here. It is the 4,896.52 is the correct amount. Um, on the second part, I didn't change it on that where it says the equals, so that is what it should be there. 
If you do the math, you'll see that's the correct number. Sorry about that. I will update the slides before um, so that we'll have the correct info out there. Uh, so category two budget pilot. Uh, when they first started this, they did a five year pilot project on this new way of doing category two. Uh, originally category two were the same as one, you just get a discount of, um... oh wait, we have another question about the, ah, okay, another question about the, the discount. This is, um, so it's once, someone wants to know, is that 4,896 each year or is that, no, that's the total for the whole five years. So this is your, the, the 9,793 is how much they think you might spend in a whole five, in the next five years. And you get a, you have, you will receive $4,896.52 over that whole five year period. So this isn't a per year thing. This is for the five years as all, all together. And then you just decide each year how much of that money you want to use, how much of the 4,000. All right, I'm reading another question that just came through here. Hang on a sec. So, the entire cost. Ah, okay, good question. Uh, someone wants to know, so if we budget, if we want to submit a Category 2 request, do we budget for the entire cost in case it is not approved for reimbursement? So that's the first question. Yes, uh, the E-rate is, that's one thing too to know about E-rate. It is not a guarantee. Uh, there is a chance that you might be denied if there's something wrong, you know, doesn't come correct in your application, or they may adjust how much they give you. They may decide actually something you asked for isn't really eligible, so we're going to give you less. So um, be prepared to either, if you do get denied, to um, be able to pay it yourself or to be able to say, okay, we can back off this year and maybe try next year and again. Uh, as I said before, most of the, dis most of the uh, denials previously were because they just ran out of money. Uh, so there's no longer that issue. The only issue with being denied would be if something was wrong with your application. Did you apply for something that wasn't actually eligible? Was there a mistake? Did you not supply some sort of documentation, whatever? And then things need to be um, denied. So definitely be, be aware that any E-rate application, even your category one for just your monthly could potentially not get approved and you will then have to cover the costs of it. Uh, and then does USEC only pay us or do they pay the vendor directly like the category one discounts? Um, actually, it, for, it, there's two different ways you can receive your discounts that I'll go into later. Uh, when you are paying something and being reimbursed, it goes directly to you, does not go through the service provider. They do direct deposits now directly to the library. So for category two, you would you know buy the equipment, then you would submit and say, hey, we bought this stuff, and then they would give you a reimbursement and it would go right directly to a bank account that you of your choosing, not through the provider at all. Um, Ah, a good question. Do you have to match that money or spend a certain amount to get the discount? No, this is not like a grant program or where you have to have a match or anything like that at all. No, this is just you tell them our library is this big, no number of square feet, and they say, great, you have this much money to spend on anything category two that you want. And then you you get that. It, there's no sort of, you know, if you don't have the match, that's okay. If you start saying we, you know, you, the first year, first year you apply for a category two uh, service that starts your five year clock. So you have five years to so spend all that money. If you don't spend it, that's okay too. There's no, it's not sort of, a, it's not like a, like a, a grant program like that, that, that requires you to spend it, requires you to show why you didn't spend the rest of it or anything like that. So there's no match that you have to have, no. Any other questions while we're here, while you're asking about category two or about category one and how that works? All right, do you have any? Go ahead and type them in and I'll grab them as soon as I see them come up. Wait, wait. All right, so this is a category two clarification here. So each purchase isn't just discounted, but can be paid if we have that amount in the bank, in the bank, so to speak, with USAC. Correct, right. So you, you'll you have in this in this example, the correct number, you have $4,896.52 that USAC will reimburse you in, in for 
for category, anything category two that you purchase. So you can start purchasing things and you just keep going until you've used up all that money. Um, and once it's done, then you just can't get any more discounts because you've gone through all the money that's there. Yeah, cool. Good, makes sense. Um, oh, good question. If the two dollars and forty-five cents amount goes up or down each year, how do you come up with the category two total? Um, yes, it um, it will change each year. Correct. It is recalculated each year depending on what their amount that that uh, they call it the multiplier is. So you there's actually a place, and I'll show it to you when we see how what your online application online account looks like. There's a place where they keep track of what your budget is. And you can see uh, how much you have in there and how much um, has been used, what the calculation is. So it will vary each year. You know, it is recalculated every year depending on what that amount is. So it's gonna, you know, it's gonna, you know, adjust a little bit. Um, but like I said, it is a couple of pennies that that amount uh, changes, which then does, you know, it does add up, of course, <laughs> when you're talking about uh, large buildings and that minimum of 9,000. So, so it will adjust every year, but they will, within your account, um, keep track of that for you once you've started the first year. So you can try and do the math yourself. If you're, multi, you're, you're welcome to do that, but you can also just pop into your account and look on your budget and see what it is for at, at the current time. It will tell you what it's been calculated for, what you've already spent, and how much you have left. So, anything else while we're here? Just wait another second here. I can't see if you're actually typing something, so I have to wait until the full question pops up. Okay, so, so okay, so clarification question here. If each year the total is different, which of them governs the overall subsidy? It will change year to year. Every year you'll it'll be it'll be whatever it is that year of what you have left. You know, they'll they'll calculate in what you've already used, what you have left, redo the calculation, and then you'll have a new amount of what you have available. And it'll just, you know update that every year based on what you've spent is already gone, take what's left, multiply it, do the math again. Okay, all right. So, as I mentioned, this there was a pilot project for this two year, or this five year budget. Uh, 2019 was the last year of the pilot. They were testing out this as a new way of doing calculations for Category 2 funding. Uh, and we are still waiting for the official release of the order on the future of the Category 2 budgets, meaning, um, let's see here, what will they do? Um, I'm just double checking. Yeah, okay. The FCC has put out their draft of their eligible services list. That's what's available right now, meaning this is our suggestions for what will happen for the upcoming year. It hasn't been officially approved. Uh, there's a little back and forth with that with people making comments. And generally, they've uh, in sometime in November, which is now, uh, they do approve and say, yes, it is the um, official uh, uh, eligible services list now. So we don't officially have a, an announcement about what it will be. Uh, the last year of the budget of the pilot was 2019, but in the draft it does say, and this is actually a quote that I took right from it, that we now propose to make the category two budget approach permanent. Uh, there was some um, discussion of would they change it, would they come up with a new way of, of doing category two, if everyone was very concerned because there was all this explanation. And if you, you did uh, attend my training last year or I heard that there was a big to do that 2019 is the last year and you need to get your category two in because we don't know what's going to happen. Well, now we know they have decided they like, they did a study, they see saw what libraries did with category two. Was it working? Were they understanding it? Eh. 
mostly. <laughs> um, it is a little confusing, but it's working. The libraries are getting their money. They think it's a good way of deciding, um, a, a good way of giving out the money. So the FCC has said they propose to make it permanent. Uh, there's been no comments back to that saying that is a horrible idea. So most likely it will um, go into effect as being the, the permanent answer that it will still have the Category 2 budgets. So before we go on to the next part, any other questions about what Category 1 is, what Category 2 is, which eligible, how the discounts work? I can answer that right now before we go on to our next part of the uh, presentation here. So if you have anything urgently you want to ask right this minute, type it in. We're going to get into the actual E-rate forms themselves in the next part. All right, on to the next page here. So before we get into the forms, there's one last uh, thing we have to talk about related to E-rate, and that is uh, SIPA and filtering. Uh, SIPA being the Children's Internet Protection Act. Uh, anything, any E-rate funding that you receive, you do need to be in compliance with SIPA now. Previously, because of when telephone existed, you didn't need to be in compliance for just receiving telephone services. But now anything E-rate related is related to internet, your access itself, your monthly bills, any of your equipment. So you do need to be in compliance with SIPA. What this means is this is having your filtering on your computers. This is any of the computers in the library. This is the uh, filter that blocks all the bad things, uh, blocking any um, um, bad sites, uh, malware, pornography, all the things uh, that you don't want the children to be looking at on the computers. So if you do filter in your library, it's great. You're all good. You're good to do E-rate. Uh, many libraries do not filter for varying reasons. Uh, there are libraries that just don't do it because it is, is difficult to figure out, which is true. Uh, we have many of our uh, libraries in the state that are just, I don't know what I should do. It's a little I don't have time to figure out what to do, and that's fine. Um, there are some libraries and some boards or communities that are of the opinion that filtering is censorship. There are some communities that refuse to filter anything at all, that they think it should all be available um, for anyone to access what they want. Um, but then there are local community standards that say, you know, really don't do that on this computer and don't do that on the children's computer and et cetera. Uh, making the parents be more in charge of what the kids can get, have access to um, and everything in between. So there's all the way from protect the children at all costs from anything bad down to don't even talk to me about filtering because it's censorship and anything in between. Uh, for E-rate purposes, however, you do need to have filters and SIPA has, uh, you have to have the filter itself, whatever kind you want. Uh, an internet safety policy, which many libraries already have anyways, you hopefully have some sort of policy or rules about how people can use your internet. Don't hack our computers, don't install bad software, <laughs> things like that. Um, and then some sort of a public meeting where you let your community know that you have, uh, are going to have these filters or you do have them on your computer. Uh, some things to know about SIPA that I'll just briefly go over here. As far as the, they call the technology protection measure, that's the filter itself. They do not, design, they do not uh, say which filter you have to use. There's no list of here's the ones you can choose from. There's nothing that specifies go with these companies or this. Uh, so it's open to whichever way you want to do it. We do have some information on my E-Rate website about uh, how to choose a filter and what ones are available. There's also no list of what you need to block. There is nothing that says you have to block YouTube or you have to block Facebook or you have to block certain sites. What there is is a criteria that you must block things that may be harmful to minors. Uh, specifically visual depictions of anything that may be harmful to minors is the actual wording. So anything pictures. Uh, there's so far at this point in our tech level of technology, there is no software program that can do that accurately, uh, that can block the physical the pictures. So we have to use things like words that might be mentioned on a website or lists of black sites, bad sites that these companies keep and good sites, black sites, white, white listed sites, the good ones. So we kind of have to do it that way. So it is a very broad policy. You are, deter you are able to determine at your community's uh, level what you are comfortable with, what you want your uh, filters to be at. Um, 
let's see, we do have a question about that. So if we've had filters for a while, would a notice be fine rather than a hearing and what constitutes proper notice? Sure, yes, many libraries have had filters and they're just now getting into doing E-rate and that's fine. Uh, well, all you'd need to do is some, you need to have something that is a public plate forum, so to speak, where uh, your, if your community wants to, they can comment to you um, about it. So it would have to be, what would, what would work would be an agenda item on an upcoming board meeting. You know, your, your library board meetings are open to the public. Just have an agenda item on there, just that we are uh, updating the fact that we have one, um, over looking over our internet safety policy and filtering, just something like that. It does have to be a public meeting that um, anyone who wanted to could come and speak at. So not just a notice saying we're doing this, but it does have to be something like that that they can publicly come to. Um, and so just having that as an agenda item on an upcoming board meeting would count if nobody comes or has any comments. That's okay. There doesn't have to be a discussion. <laughs> it just has to be that it was a, a, available to people to come by and, and uh, discuss with you what, what, what you're doing at the library, how's it working, and all of those kind of things. Um, SIPA also has some things that are very useful to us as libraries in that it is very um, vaguely written. Um, it does say, like I said, it doesn't have anything specific that you have to block. doesn't specifically say at what level you have to block. If you are concerned about um, blocking too many things, many of our uh, filters that exist now do block things like breast cancer research website because it has the word breast in it, which is wrong. People should be able to access that. Uh, you can put your filters at the lowest level of security so it doesn't block as many things and it will still meet the SIPA requirements um, as long as you do have that. So it's up to you to decide how you're going to do that. Uh, you also do have to have your filters on every computer that your library owns that does connect to the internet. That does include um, that um, your staff computers, staff computers in the back room that might access the internet, do cataloging or whatever, your office computers, anything that uses the internet service that you're gonna get a discount on, you have to have uh, the filters on. So it's not just on the children's computers that access the internet, which some people think it has to be on any computer that you do have the access to. Now, it also has a, a criteria that states you have to be able to turn off the filter at the request of an adult, and they say an adult is 17 or older, who requests that you do it for bona fide research, legal research. So you need to do your job, you need to have the filter turned off on your you know, computers in, in your tech services area, then yes, you, you install it, but turn it off, you're good for as far as SIPA is concerned. Um, so do keep that in mind. You do have to have it and have this all documented so that if E-rate does come back, they may come at some point and want to question you and just double check. Do you have it on the computers? Did you have your meeting? What, you know, just let, let us know. Um, so keep track of all of that. Uh, question, just to clarify, the public notice meeting needs to be done on an annual basis. No, 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 sorry. No, it does not need to be done annually. You do this once. As long as you have, have at one time had a public notice and meeting about what you're doing related to filtering, that's that's the only time you have to do it. It does not have to be a regular thing. Um, the only time to do it again would be if you're changing something, maybe. If you're just changing to a different filtering product for some reason, or choosing to no longer filter, which would then dump you out of E-rate. Um, so no, it's just a one-time thing. So if you did have this on at a board meeting 10 years ago when you first started filtering, just find those minutes and those notes about it and you're covered. So this is just a one-time thing that you have to do. You'd never have to do it again unless something changed in your situation. All right. Any other questions about SIPA before we move on? Type into your question section and I can answer some basic questions about it. Um, generally speaking, it's not too difficult to comply with. Uh, if you just do a little bit of legwork to begin with, and it doesn't have to impose too much on what your library, your users are doing, uh, because it can be, you know, very low-level security if you want to. All right. There is information on the USAC website as well um, about SIPA that they have it up there explaining that they have they have about it, and there's information on our website as well that you'll see on our last slide here. All right, so on to the various E-rate forms. 
E-rate is an ongoing process that you do uh, throughout the year. There are multiple forms that you submit, and we're going to go through each one of them now here. So there are four basic forms in the E-rate process. Uh, the first three here on the list, and we're going to go into this, the details of all of them, 470, 71, 46, everyone always does those every year. Um, so you have definitely one, two, three forms that you do. The last form, 474, 72, depends on your situation at that point, and we'll get into the details about this. Uh, there is a fifth form that is a new one that is, I mentioned earlier, because um, someone did ask, in order to get your direct deposit of your reimbursements, you do have to provide banking information to E-Rate, of course, similar to doing direct deposit for your uh, paycheck. Uh, but that's a one-time form, so it's not part of a regular annual process. You do that once and tell them what your uh, banking info is, and then you don't have to do that ever again, unless, of course, your your bank account, whatever bank account the library is using changes. <laughs> so first form of the process, you're asking for a service. I'm looking for someone to provide me the service. Second form, I, you tell USAC who you've picked uh, to be that, um, provide that service and what the service is. Uh, fourth, third form, you tell USAC I'm getting the service, everything started, so I'm ready to receive my money. And then the fourth form, depending on your situation, you are receiving your bills, you're getting the service, you, that's when you tell USAC how you want to receive your money. And we're going to go into the specifics of how each one of these forms works. So this is just kind of a general overview here. So the first thing to know about the forms, though, is document retention. You do have to retain copies of anything for up to 10 years for E-rate purposes, so anything related to your E-rate application. Um, and this is 10 years after the last date of service. That's the end of your fu our funding year. Our funding years, you remember, go from July through June. So for 2020, which we're in right now, that is through June 30th of 2031. Seems like such a long time from now. <laughs> so anything related to this year's application, you have to keep through them. Um, so any contracts, any documentation. Uh, SIPA, as I mentioned just previously, if you, whenever you had that meeting and those forms and or the meeting and installed the software, you always keep that documentation documentation forever because that will always apply to any future E-rate that you do. Uh, anything else, uh, you just do for the ten years. Um, if you have a recurring contract. So you signed up with a service provider, you know, eight years ago, and you have just an ongoing contract. You don't have to re-sign something every year. Um, you will have to keep that as well. As long as it has, even if you signed the contract, as this example says in 2010, you're still getting the services in 2020 based on that, that contract that you first signed up with in 2010, you've got to keep those until the 2031 date as well. So certain things may have happened before 2020, but they affect 2020. You have to keep it through 2020's deadline, which is the 2031 date. You can keep this in any way that works for you. It does not have to be paper. You do not have to. I used to have binders full of things. I know some people describe file cabinet drawers. You don't have to have it that way. You can keep it electronically if you want to. So uh, print out things as P or download things as PDF. Scan any paperwork you have. Keep it on a flash drive or in a folder somewhere in your computer in electronic form. That is perfectly fine. Uh, you just need to be able to access whatever documentation USAC might want to ask you about in the future um, easily. So be able to get a hold of that to them. Um, USAC does do periodically uh, what they call audits, which does sound scary. It's not an audit like the, it's not like an audit that the IRS does. It has nothing to do with IRS audits. This is just a checks and balances type of thing where they um, randomly choose some libraries each year to see how the process is going. Um, is it working? Do you like how it's working? Was it easy for you to figure out? All of that. And they will then need you provide documentation of what you did in a particular year um, for that purpose. Um, okay, so uh, someone has a question here about documents. Due to staff and board turnover, is there a way to retrieve any missing copies? Um, as far as any, well, anything E-rate related, yes, we can access previous forms and uh, documentation related to previous E-rate applications for you um, if you need them through your online account. Uh, they do keep track of it yourself there, there, so anything they've contacted you with, yes. If there's something outside of their system, like a contract you had with a company or conversation, something you documented yourself, that would be something, unfortunately, you'd have to figure out where the old information went. Uh, 
Now, something to be aware of, this 10-year number changed as of 2014, I believe it is. Uh, previously, it was a five-year time period. You had to keep them for five years. They decided with some changes to the, to the E-rate program to make it a longer time period, 10 years. So uh, this only goes into, a, you know, starting with that, you know, going forward, 10 years back. So if you right now, you know, only have five years because that's how what it was before for for a previous year that's okay you don't have to suddenly find the older five years worth for you know for like a 2016 application we only had to do you know, like in 2010 we only had to keep five years back do i now have to find 10 years back or something like that no you don't have to do that kind of thing it's each year it's whatever the years back were at that time um so don't have to suddenly go and find 10 years worth of information for when, when the rules only said five at that time of that application. Um, but yes, yeah, so you can find, look at, and I'll show you actually where you can look up any of your current, any forms you've done um, in the new E-rate system. Um, we can even look up things in older as well on the E-rate website going back. Um, as far as the program has existed, we can always look up older forms, um, older applications um, that has to do with that. But if there's, like I said, any documentation you were keeping, that would be up to you to be able to find that if you need to. Now the kind of things you need to um, retain is basically anything related to your application, the actual forms you submit, any responses back from USAC, any other correspondence from them asking questions, um, any bids for services, any companies that, that reach out to you saying, hey, we want to provide you with these services, the contracts that you sign, the agreements, uh, delivery, invoices, uh, shipping um, information, anything related to getting equipment, um, any, any decision-making processes, you know, why did you pick some company, and we'll talk about more detail of that, um, any correspondence, anything related to uh, what you did on that E-rate application, you do need to keep for those 10 years. If you're not sure, just scan a copy of it and put it in the file, and at least you have something, and rather than trying to scramble for it, if they come back to you three years from now saying, I wanna ask you about this thing back in 2019, so any other questions about document retention? Basically, keep everything. All right. So I've been talking about your online account, and this is the E-Rate portal. E-Rate has a new, their most recent incarnation of the E-Rate online applications is called the E-Rate Productivity Center. EPIC is the acronym for it. Um, it's, it's, the acronym is EPC, but it's pronounced EPIC by them. Uh, so this is where all of your E-Rate activity happens. Uh, almost all your forms, mine, except for one that we'll talk about, are submitted online via this portal. You log into it and you can access all of your everything you've done. Um, and here, everything starting in 2016 forward. Anything previous to that was done on the previous online systems or on paper forms. It used to be all paper forms. There are places on the E-Rate website to look up uh, what was what were what, what what those forms were in um, previous you know versions, um, but they're not in this Epic system. It's only the ones 2016 forward are in there. Um, you can go to this U uh, URL here to get directly into it. Um, it's a um, it's a really good interface. Uh, they went through a couple of incarnations of an online for, um, applications, and uh, some of them not too pretty, <laughs> not too not as useful. Uh, this one is is pretty good. It's very slick. It's very neat. We'll see some screenshots of it here. Um, it's one stop shopping for everything you need to do related to E-rate. You submit your applications. Um, E-rate will respond to you with any questions they may have. You can ask questions of them. Um, all your notifications are in there. Everything is in one place for you to look up. Um, you can also access it from any device. Uh, previously, there were some limitations on that. You can do it on your um, on your computer, your laptop, tablet. You can even look up things on your phone if you wanted to, uh, on your smartphone. Uh, I would not recommend submitting any form, completing and submitting any forms on a telephone. That would be way too, yeah. Crazy, um, too difficult. But if you just need to double check on an application, check a check a notification. You could easily log into your application there and at least check and see did they send me this notice. Um, and you can use any browser. Uh, previously, we were limited to using Internet Explorer only for E-rate online forms, but now you can use anything, um, i.e., Firefox, Chrome, Safari, whichever is your browser of choice. Now um, you. 
log in to the uh, website link that I gave you before, and you set up to create an account for your organization, that's your library, and one person designated as an account administrator, the one person in charge of everything in your account. If you've previously applied for E-Rate, this would be the person who had done your forms in the past. You're automatically set up with an application, or with an account. If you have never done an E-Rate before and you're brand new, you will contact USAC. There's an 800 number they give you to call them, and they will then set you up as an account administrator for your library, and your library's account will get set up. Uh, you can have other users if you wish, if you have other people on your in your library who you want to be involved with submitting your application, entering information or anything, you can create account, user accounts for them as well. Uh, and there's different levels of permissions you can have for these people as well, which is nice. You can have full users, so you can do everything and anything. Complete the forms, file things, certify, answer questions, whatever. Um, partial, where they can help enter information. This might be an IT person needs to provide you with details about what you're applying for, but you don't want them to actually submit the forms because they don't have that kind of authority. Uh, or view only. They can just go in and look at anything, um, but really can't make any changes to any of your applications. So it depends on which um, what you want people to do. Um, here in Nebraska, most of our libraries, it's a single person doing it, so it's just you as the account administrator, and that's perfectly fine. So this is the USEC, um, the E-Rate website, usec.org slash SL for schools and libraries. Um, and um, everything we have here is going to do screenshots of the forms just because it's uh, much easier to make sure everything works. Um, on their website, there is a link under resources and tools to the E-Rate Productivity Center. Um, when you click on that, you have some information about it. You can see here there's some general guidance underneath there. There's videos. There you've got lots of good training on their website and their online learning library. Short, not even five minute ish videos of how to use different parts and and of the system, how to do different parts of your E-rate forms. Uh, if you are a new user, as I mentioned, and you've never used done E-rate before or you don't know what's up with your account, there is a contact us option right under there, underneath the Epic button there to log in. That will just tell you, call our 800 number, talk to someone in our customer service department, and they will get you all set up with your account. Now when you do click on the button, you agree to their the, the usual terms and services, and then you get your logout screen. Your um, username is going to be your email address, whatever email address you have told them is the one you want to use, and then you create your own password. They do not generate passwords for you. Um, USAC and me, we do not know what your current password is. There's no way to look that up. It's all under your control. Um, but there is um, some criteria, the usual security criteria of what you have to do <laughs> to create a password. Uh, at least eight characters long, uh, can't be the same one from the previous four, you have to have at least one number, one special character, one uppercase, and one lowercase letter. Uh, that does sound very crazy and confusing, but this is the you know standard of what you need to do to have a strong password. What I recommend is you don't need to create a new password every single every single time it makes you do this. That's one thing about the system as well. It does require that you um, create a new password every 60 days, which does sound crazy um, and a, a bit extreme, but that is a security thing. Uh, some uh, security companies, like the company that has created this uh, service, the interface for USAC has said, that's what we need to do to be secure. You gotta change your password regularly. If you have a strong enough password, which actually meets all of these criteria, it's really hard to hack. Um, so there's there's differing opinions on what you need to do to be secure. Most security expert, experts are coming up with changing your password regularly as actually less secure because people don't remember it. They have to write it down somewhere. It's, so then someone can just walk in and find out, oh, hey, here's their password written down on this piece of paper because you're making me change it constantly. These guys are still on the side of change it regularly. So you will have to change it on a regular basis. Uh, what I recommend is don't come up with something brand new every single time. What will happen is periodically you'll have to you'll log in to do a form and it will say, oh, your password's expired. You need to do a new one. Come up with a format and, and then just change one character of it each time. So, for example, your uh, password could be E-Rate, uh, PubLib, uh, number sign one, the number one. And then when it comes up and asks you to change it again, change the number one to a two. Leave everything else the same. E-Rate, PubLib, number two. Capitalize E, capitalize maybe the P in Pub, whichever you want to do. 
then it, when it says again, change the two to three, three to four, et cetera, et cetera, until you've gone all the way through one through nine. You will go past that previous four passwords limitation, um, and you won't have to re-memorize a whole brand new password every time. So just don't don't create something brand new every time. Give yourself a, a nice formatted one, and then just change one thing. It could be the number, it could be the special character, whatever you want. I do mine, I have a format one, it's not the one I just told you, <laughs> but it's a certain format and I just change the number every time. And I've done it multiple times, I've been doing this since the system came out, was done in 2016, and I've gone through one through nine already a few times and it works. So um, make it easy on yourself that way. Uh, let's see, we do have a question. So I'm guessing since no one has used E-Rate excuse me, at our library since the E-Rate portal, since Epic portal began, I would use the contact us and make a new account. Yes, what I would say is use the contact us um, on uh, here and reach out to them and uh, tell them what library you're from and they, they, may, be able, they may be able to find a account, uh, something already set up for your library potentially. Uh, it was kind of iffy about whether organizations were automatically set up and I've never been able to figure out which ones were and which ones weren't and why, <laughs> but have them look up your library and there may be a library account, they just need to set you up as an administrator of it. Um, if not, they may need to go the whole route of setting up an actual li library itself and you as a uh, administrator of it. They do also um, say they will ask for some some official documentation, uh, generally a letter, some a memo on library letterhead or the city's letterhead if that works for you saying yes, this is so and so person at so and so library and they should be the account administrator and please set them up for E-rate. So they'll want you to send something in, in, in print to do that. All right, and if you're just not sure, you know, you think somebody did do it, and this happens a lot too, you had a previous person at your library, a previous director who did the E-rate, then they left and did not leave behind any of their passwords or login information, that's very common, uh, that's that's fine, you just reach out on that same thing, contact us, explain your situation, I'm the new director, the old one didn't leave me anything, I have no idea what's going on, they will set you up as an account administrator on your library's account. So once you get logged in, you end up on your applicant landing page. And that's what this is. And we're going to go into all the parts of this. This is a pretty big screenshot of just to show you the whole thing here. Um, there is notifications where you can look up anything about any of your applications. There's a link here to look for inf information about your organization. Um, customer service cases listed here. At the bottom, this is where you can look up um, forms. So someone, you're asking, where do I find old forms? All of your old forms are listed here. You can search them. Um, in the upper right, you can go into all different, um, the different application forms that you'd submit and look at more information about your account. So we're gonna go into all the different parts of this. Uh, first, um, right across the top, there is a bar here with some uh, menu items that go into a few different things here. The first one all the way on the left is called news. Um, this is um, news items, kind of self-explanatory, I suppose. Uh, um, anything that USAC is keeping track of you for your library or some general things. This here is showing a screenshot of the SL, Schools and Libraries, news briefs. Uh, once a week on Fridays, they put out a newsletter. It's an email newsletter that you can sign up for and get sent to you in your email if you want to, or it also comes up in your Epic account. So this is where you can see each one gives you the news of the week. I highly recommend signing up for it if you do want to keep up with what's going on with E-Rate. Uh, what's coming up, things you need to be worried about, deadlines, uh, tips and tricks on how to submit things. Um, however, it also does include everything, all news items. Uh, E-Rate applications and everything you do in E-Rate is public. Anyone can see what you've submitted, uh, who's applying, all that information. If you want to just see what's your library's news, you have a better, there's a better way to get to just seeing what's related to your library. Um, from your landing page, and I've zoomed in a bit here, under here it says welcome and your library's name would be here. Click on your library's name and then you've got a sub menu here of a whole bunch of different things about your library. Click on the news item here and this will bring you to just news items related, just items related to your library. So here this is me getting a notification letter, uh, funding being certified, 
um, acknowledgement letter, and if I scroll down, even more things. So if you just want to see the news items related to your, your institution rather than everybody's go that way to get your news. Um, I'll also point out here while we're here, this is where that Category 2 budget is tracked as well. So you see here there's a link for Category 2 budget in the upper right there. That's where you can click on and see what your budget is, what you've used, how much you have left. Now the second item across the top of the blue bar is tasks. This is things that you're in the middle of doing, um, things that the E-Rate wants you to do or they want you to do. So when you submit, when you start working on a form in E-Rate in, in Epic, it tra it saves as you go. So you can um, log in, do, do a form. If you get interrupted or you realize you need to go look up some other information, it will save where you left off and then you can pop back into it. It will leave that as a task here when you're in the middle of something. The wording is uh, confusing. Uh, I wish they had a little more control over it from the programmers of what it's called, but create form, whatever it means, that's when you're still in the middle of creating. That's a way of thinking of it. It doesn't mean it wants you to create one. It means this is a form you've actually started. That's the only reason to be on this list because you went in and started something. Um, that last one there was reviewing a PDF. You finished up the form, they might review what you did before you finally did the actual final submission. So anything that you need to work on or keep up with, this is where you'll find that. The third item across the top is records. This is a long list of all these different kind of things you can do with the system. Uh, look up different forms you've submitted, uh, look up different, if you've had an appeal for an app for something, uh, consulting firms, customer services cases you've done. I've actually got a second screen that goes even farther down. Uh, changes to things, looking up service providers, looking up users, all these different things. Just a long list of things that you can look at there. Some of them you use regularly, some you'll never even go into. Um, reports, they don't have much on there yet. Uh, this is where you can pop back to your landing page, so link back to start. And any request changes. When you submit a form, you still you always have a chance to change it afterwards. Uh, you know, there's a certain time where you can realize you made a mistake um, and you can see your changes there. And then actions, uh, kind of some leftover things. This is where you can reach out to their customer service. Um, thing, um, you can search for certified forms of yours down here. And then one here in the middle is an example. If there's any sort of things that are affecting the E-rate uh, deadlines, uh, generally things like natural disasters or, or something that is a, they know will be affecting so many libraries and they're gonna give special dispensation for them to be late with their forms or contact USAC if you need to talk to them about whatever. There's orders that go out helping them be able to get, be able to not lose out on their funding. So back to your applicant page, uh, your applicant landing page. In the upper right-hand corner, there is a little head silhouette here. This is your profile for you as an individual. You remember, you logged in with your email address. So this is you using E-Rate for your library. So you have a whole bunch of user information for yourself. If you hover over that little head, it pops up with your name. If you click on it, it brings up a little menu of where you can change your profile, change your settings, or this is also where you can log out of the a system when you're done using it for the time. If we click on profile, um, we get this page. Uh, it looks very uh, social media-ish. I think this this program this that they have they're using here to put E-Rate into does have those those um, applications. We don't generally use it for those purposes, but it's in there. Uh, you'll notice in the middle there's your head and it says edit profile and there's this big red notice across the bottom. <laughs> now this says uh, please use the manage epic user profile related action located in the top right of the screen to edit your profile. Do not use the edit profile button located under the user picture. They've updated the system for whatever reason, I don't know that we were told the reason why, but this edit profile just brings up and shows you what your profile has in it, but it doesn't let you actually do anything. You do need to use the manage button in the upper right. Hopefully at some future update, they'll clean this up a little bit. As of now, this is what it tells us to do. Um, and if you do hit that, then you get where you can go in and change any of the information about you as a user. Um, this is um, good if your your library has moved, you have new address, phone number, things like that. Name changes too. Um, you'll notice here I've got a little uh, mismatching here of last name. Uh, Krista Porter, Krista Burns. I got married a couple of years ago, three years ago. When I started using E-Rate, originally Burns was my last name and it was my email address, so that was my uh, login for E-Rate. But since then, my last name is Porter. My email address at my work here at the Library Commission has changed to Krista.Porter at Nebraska.gov. Um, I'll show you how we can change all of that. 
if you're at a library where you are the new director, but you have like a standard director email address, like you know, library director at publiclibrary.org, and you just need to change the name that's being done, you can just do that here and just leave the username the same because it's the same email address. If you need to change the email address, however, you do have to do some other steps here. And this is just the bottom half of that page just to show you it's the rest of the address, the mailing address. Now, on our landing page, we can manage users. This is where you can add or remove or update um, any other people you might want to have use your library's um, E-Rate app account. Uh, you check in the box for your organization. Now, this may seem confusing and, and a waste of a step to many of our libraries. We have a, in Nebraska, most all our public libraries are individual libraries, um, just a single organization. Uh, the E-Rate system, though, is built for up to you know the large organizations as well, which have multiple branches of a public library or multiple locations of a school so in their situation there would be a long list of things here and they have to pick the right one uh, we just you know use it as it is here so we choose what ours is um, uh, checking the box there and then here I'll show you how you can create a new user and this is where you'll get a blank, blank form and this one I filled in with all the new user for me as um, a new user with my new email address Krista Porter at Nebraska.gov. So if you have just another person you want to add, you would do this. Once you create this, an email is sent to that person at the email address telling them they've had an account created and to and notifying them, okay, now you go log in, um, create yourself a, a, a password and uh, using the forget password option on the main login screen and then they'll have access to the account, to the library's account. This is also how if you are having a situation like I have where my email address changed and I want to change that in the E-Rate system because I can no longer get email notifications at my old email address or I'm a new library director and we each have our own personal email addresses that we need to use you know, by our name. The way you do that is you create a new user for either, in this case I'm creating me with a new email address or you the current email address. You create that. There is below this, there is the user permission section as well, where you can decide what kind of access this person will have. Um, and you can see here, you can do it by form, by what they can do each different thing. If you're the only person doing E-Rate for your library, you would do, everybody gets, I, I get full rights across the board, I need to be able to do everything. They do have this apply all option at the very beginning there where you can just say, I want full rights for everything with one click, boom. Uh, then you would go into your library's account here using the welcome link. And when you go into look at your organization information, in the upper right here, there's an extra menu here that you can open up where you can modify your account administrator. So this is, I am the, in me, my case, I'm just changing my email address. So I'm creating a new username. I'm going to switch it to that one with a new email address. Or I'm the new director and I have a different email address than the previous director, so I need to use mine. You're going to modify it because you're the current account administrator. You're going to modify it. Now, if you don't have the login info for the old director, you might need to contact USAC to help you out with this. But if you do, or you can just have them set you up with it, yeah. You have the same, if you have the email address, if you have access to it, you can just change the password, use it, make it your, make your own account, user account, and switch it over. So when you do that, you see you'll have a, cho a list here, um, showing here the organization who is the current account administrator and all the um, available users. So you can see I've got me as the uh, current one with Krista.Burns, and there's me, the new one I created, Krista.Porter. I move the checkbox, uncheck that, check that one instead, and then it will confirm. So here's the current one, Krista.Burns, is going to be changed to Krista.Porter. Submit. And now when I go back to the organization, you'll notice down here in the lower left, before we go on to the pop-up menu you have there, it shows who your current account administrator and general contact are. There's two different contacts here. And you notice here it just gives the name. It doesn't show the email address, which is the login. Uh, could be better, because I'd like to know that since my name is the same, you know, no matter what the email address was. But you just have to go in and check and see what they look like. So over here now, you also want to change your general contact as well if that's something, you know, if you're going to be the one person doing it, that may be the old email address, old name as well. Same thing, same exact thing. It's just now you're talking about the general contact. Uncheck the old one, Krista Burns. Check Krista Porter. You'll see who's the current one, who the new one's going to be. You submit. 
and now you're all set and everything has been switched over to you as the new one. I could go in and delete the old uh, user account if I wanted to for me as Krista.Burns. I can leave it there. Now that I'm the account administrator, it's all under my control though, so um, it's all good. Now you can also manage your organization in here. Uh, where you can change anything about your library. Check in the box, manage organization. And if your library moves, change the address, uh, change your urban and rural status. This defaults to the information that's given out by the US Census. You can change it if you need to. This is a long page, scroll down. There's a mailing address, other ways to contact you. Um, library information, what kind of library you are here. This is for me as the library commission. I'm a like, state library agency. You would of course be a, just public library. This is also where you enter your square footage of your library to be used for your Category 2 calculation. So um, this is a, is a required field, so this is where you would put that in. And you just enter it here once, and that's always used for all your future applications. The, the last part of this is where you have your school district. Um, if it knows, it will put in one. If there isn't one in there as you're associated, you can do a search and find out which ones are um, local to you, and then choose to select them to be your school district. Um, the school district is who enters in the information to the EPIC system about the school lunch numbers. You don't have to actually enter that number, those inf that information in there anymore. We used to have to as libraries. We just let the schools do that for us. And because we're connected to them by this, it automatically fills in the right discount for us. Uh, the last thing on here is an FCC registration number. This is something that's now required. Um, and Anyone doing business with the FCC, which you are because you're participating in E-Rate, has to have one of these numbers. I didn't know that we had one the commission, but we did, and it, I was able to find it. There's a website from the FCC to look up and see if you have one, and if you don't, to go ahead and request one. It's a quickie uh, form to fill out. They send you an email in just a few minutes. Boom, you have it. Uh, a couple other things to be aware of, identifying numbers. Uh, for each organization, each library is assigned a build entity number. It's called your BEN number that you'll get asked about a lot sometimes from USAC. That's something like a social security number for a person. It's the um, number for E-rate purposes associated with your library. Um, that's set up from the first time your library is set up in, in E-rate and is for the life of the library is, is that. Uh, service providers have their own ID number called a SPIN number that you have to use to designate who, which service provider you're going to be working with. Um, they may have more than one, so uh, if you're not sure what's the right one to use, if you're doing something new with the, the service provider, double check with them on which one to use. If you're still continuing with the same old service you've always had with them, you should be good to just use whatever one you've always been using. So that's the basics of the EPIC system itself. Now let's get into some actual forms, the actual forms themselves. Um, so any questions about the system in itself and using anything in, there we go, in the form, in the, um, just the basics of the system. Um, okay, so the question says, earlier in the presentation you showed website links and the steps for getting our discount, but just now you showed us within the EPIC system, so are the websites just, yes, so the website's just for looking up what our discount would be. Yes, the websites, um, the information out there is just to find out, so you can look up if you want to before getting, deciding to do E-rate, what your discount could be. Um, once you're doing E-rate, it's all automatic by the numbers that the schools put in and it automatically does the calculation for you in there, yeah. Um, do all vendors we might use, there's another question, for category two purchases need to have a spin? Yes, anyone participating in E-rate who wants to participate in E-rate, whether it's for you as an applicant or a service provider as providing you with the equipment or services, needs to um, apply to be part of the program so that USAC can track who they are and, and pass on the discounts and everything to them. So they would have to do their side. Everything you're doing here, um, E-rate related, they have their own forms that they're submitting as well on their side to participate in the program. They don't apply for the discounts you do, but they say, yes, we are going to be a participant. So they do need to have a SPIN number as well. Um, and there's a whole part of the USAC website that is all about um, for service providers. I don't help service providers do their thing, uh, so I know 
I, but I know enough of you know some about it, so they wouldn't come to me to help them do it. But there's a whole page that says go here to sign up for the program. They just have to submit forms basically, and then give you the discounts. Uh, there's an annual form they make sure they submit every year saying yes, we're still participating. Uh, they they have a lot easier time than you guys <laughs> at it, but they do all have to have a spin number for you to use. Yes. So yes, things like Best Buy or Amazon would um, it would be they wouldn't be able to unless they have somehow put together yeah we'll do e right well and the thing is too some your discounts if you're buying something and getting reimbursement it's not going through the service provider anymore um, so it is much easier for them to just say yeah we'll participate if I can just fill out a form every year and then you buy from us and and we get the and you get the discount so for some local companies it might be easy for you to convince them Best Buy or Amazon not some yeah no unfortunately All right, so the first form in the E-rate process is the Form 470. This is something you submit right now. It's been available since the summer. Um, this officially opens what they call a competitive bidding process. You are, when you're doing E-rate, putting an open call out to anyone out there who might provide a, potentially provide a service saying, we're looking for someone to provide us with this service. Um, if you have a current provider, that's fine. You don't have to start new and say, oh no, we're gonna have to pick somebody new because somebody different contacted us. It's not not necessarily, um, but you are just saying there is some, we're looking for anybody to provide us with this. In Nebraska, generally our libraries, there's not very much competition out in 90% of the state in the rural areas. Uh, it is whoever you have, it's who you have, and that's fine. Um, but every now and then new companies pop up and you might find some competition and maybe a potential better um, provider. You never know. Uh, there are some times when you do not need to do a 470, however. Um, if you um, have a multi-year contract with a company, and this is as in a contract with a beginning and an end date, a specific beginning and end date, where you, for example, you said, the provider said, if you lock us in with us for a three-year contract, um, from you know this year to three years down the road, um, we will lock in your price. And then you only do a 470 the first year when you're first looking to get that contract. The other years, you're not, you no longer need to find a provider because you're locked in with them. You actually skip and just do the second form of the process, con confirming to E-rate every year that yes, we are still working with this company. So you'd only do it the first year. Um, if you have, if you're just doing paying month to month, where you you signed a contract five years ago and it just keeps going and going and going without having to sign a new contract every year, that's not the same thing as a multi-year. Multi-year contracts means contract with a, an official end date, where once that three years is up, you will have to re-sign a new contract. In that case, you do this. Uh, if you're just doing month to month, every year you do the 470. Um, also, something new. I'm um, trying to encourage companies to provide this kind of really fast, really you know, cheaper service. If you have somebody in your area who is offering at least 100 megabits per second download for $300 a month, you don't have to even do any sort of competition. You just go with them and that's it. Um, you just skip the 470 and just start with the 471 saying, hey, we found somebody who provides us with this service. Um, when I first started doing this a few years ago, it didn't wasn't really out there, but I'm starting to hear that some places are actually offering the 100 megabits. I'm talking more, you know, obviously rural areas here in Nebraska. So um, look and see if this is available. If it is, it can save you and your service provider a lot of work. <laughs> Now, to get to your 470 from your main landing page, there's an FCC Form 470 link up there in the top. Uh, it automatically fills in your library's basic info, and then you have to give the form a nickname. This is something for your purposes. Name it whatever you want, um, just for your, just so that you can track uh, this particular form. Since you will be working on multiple years at the same time as I mentioned earlier, it's good to know which one is which. <laughs> um, this is how sometimes USEC will reach out to you too. So here I did FY 2020 470, pretty standard. Um, on the bottom here, there's a uh, discard form, save and share, save and continue buttons, three different buttons you can use. Discard is if you realize, no, wait, I didn't want to do this form, I just want to get rid of it. You can discard your form. Uh, save and share is if you have someone else within the E-rate system, like another user you need to pass this on to. Generally, that's for the situation where I'm the librarian and I can fill out some of this, but only our, you know, superintendent of our schools is officially allowed to uh, you know certify and actually submit the form that kind of thing um, for most of us though we just saving we're just doing it ourselves so we save and continue 
Uh, the next screen just confirms all the information about your library. If it's all correct, you're good to go on. If not, you'd go out into that manage app organization and fix anything. So um, save and continue again. Uh, contact person. Oh, consultant information. Uh, there are companies out there that you can pay to help you do your E-rate application. I am called, yes, your state E-rate consultant for libraries. It's, I'm not the same kind of thing. You guys don't pay me. <laughs> it's my job to do this for you as working at the state library here. Um, but if you do consult with some firm that does it for you, generally large organizations need someone to run do this for them, you would enter that, have that entered there. Um, but if you're the main contact, you just say yes, and it automatically pulls in your information there. As you can see here, I did the screenshot before I changed my, my email address. I'll get into that. Um, and save and continue. And now here's where you can ask for whichever category of service you want. You can either do one, category one um, request, just category two on this 470, or you can do both. Uh, whichever works out for you. Uh, some people like to keep category two and one separate on two separate 470s, and that's fine just so they can keep those kind of um, projects separate in their, in their minds and in their paperwork. Category one being mainly maybe just my monthly internet that I have. Category two being the special project that we're doing with upgrading the computer lab. And I want to keep all those paperwork separate. That's perfectly fine to keep them on two different things. You just go through this 470 twice. Um, or you can do one form where you do everything all in one. Your choice. Um, for this demonstration, I've done both together. Uh, RFP. A 470 serves the purpose of an RFP, a request for proposal or a request for quote, so to speak, where you're giving the information out to any potential providers who might want to contact you. Um, but if you have some bigger project, more than just what this form can provide, you need to give a lot more detail about we're building a new library and here's all the information about it, or um, you, know, you need more detail, you would have some sort of separate document that's already been created that you could then upload here if you want to, to give them all that info. Uh, for my purposes, I'm going to say no. Save and continue. And this is where we can choose our particular things we want to discount on. There's category one at the top, category two at the bottom. So I'm going to add a new service request, a new request for a discount on a service. And when I first go in there, it opens up a nice pull down um, pop up with some uh, helpful information about what are the different things you can ask for. And I'm just going to explain a bit about a few of these. Uh, the first one there is your lit fiber. So if you just know you've got fiber and that's it, you can just do fiber. Uh, the second one is anything, basically everything else is not fiber. <laughs> Internet access and transport together uh, for all the other kinds of connections that are not my fiber connection. So if that's the kind of service you know you have or that you're looking for, you would choose that one. Uh, the next two, generally speaking, for most school libraries in Nebraska, you don't choose those. Those are for like larger organizations. Sometimes their Internet service and the getting the service to their building are two separate things and very much separated in their bills and in, in who they get it from and say ask for it separately. If you do that, you're going to get a call from USAC saying, are you sure you only wanted transport? Because that means you're not getting the actual service. You just got the connection. Or are you sure you just want the service and not the connection? Because if you just did the internet access one, ISP service only and not transport, how are you getting it to the building? It's yeah. So generally speaking, for most of our independent libraries doing the standard, you don't do that. You want that bundled one above it because that com encompasses everything. Um, and then there's the least dark and lit together. That's the one I was talking about. If you're, you know fiber exists, but you want to explore and see if there is any dark fiber to be turned on, you do that combo one. Um, and then there's the ones for maintenance and, and operation and everything. So that's just some help there. Now, if we go up to above it is where we actually have the pull down menu to add this, what we want, and then we can choose whichever one um, we're doing. Um, and you can do multiple ones of these. I'm going to do an example here of just doing the Internet Access and Transport Bundled just for the non-fiber, so I'm looking for that. But if I also wanted to ex you know, explore and say, I want to know just what's out there, I would go through all this process a second time and maybe do uh, least lit, at least dark and lit fiber as a second um, service request just to say, I want to see just what's available in all types of connections and see who contacts me. Your 470 is really your wish list of what I would love to have, all the different things I might want to get. Um, you don't have to end up getting everything you list on the 470. That's your second form where you say what you actually ended up with, the 471. This is my, if I could have the highest internet connection and the highest, the best fiber connection, I would love to get it. In the end, you might end up with something else, but that's okay. So here I've chosen Internet Access and Transport Bundled, and then I've got a few other questions I have to answer. Quantity, I have just one connection to my building. 
And then what speed? Uh, there's a pull-up menu here for both minimum and maximum speed. It goes all the way from like, I think something kilobytes down uh, all the way up now to multiple gigabytes um, and everything in between. There's a whole range. So you choose from here what you want. Uh, definitely go think bigger than what you know you can get. So if you know you're currently getting 25 megabits per second for maximum, don't just put 25 down because faster might be available to you and you might be able to afford it. So put fit, choose 50 as, the, as your maximum or choose 100 even, whatever you want to. Just has to make sure it falls within that range of your minimum and maximum what you end up with. If you say maximum is 25, but you end up finding a company who will offer you 50 megabits per second, you'll only get a discount up to 25, the cost of up to 25 megabits. You'll have to pay full price for the rest. So think big, think all encompassing, and you'll end up with something in the middle there. Number of entities served, you're just one library. And do you need installation? In this case, I'm saying this is just for us to continue with our current provider. I don't need it installed. It's what we already have, so I don't. If you are willing to have, needing, know, you know, knowing I'm going to have to have a new connection run because this is a new building, my internet service for the first time, whatever, you would say, yes, I would like to have installation. And then you click the add button. Uh, and you'll see now it puts it into a little table there with all the d d basic information about it. If I wanted to add, also, I want to look for fiber, I'd hit add new service request, that blue button again, choose the fiber option, put down its speeds, and it would add it as a second option there. There is a little narrative if you like. You can enter more details in there about it. I just wrote here monthly internet service for the library. Any little extra details you might want to um, add into here. This is kind of like I don't need to write a full RFP like that previous choice where I could upload a giant document, but I want to give a little detail about what we're doing. You could enter that here. If you scroll down below that, there's an installment payment plan question. For large construction projects, USAC knows that sometimes these companies will let you pay as you pay in installments. And if that's the case, if you are doing that kind of a project, they just want to know that that's how the money is going to be paid. Uh, now we can do a Category 2 service. It works the same way as a Category 1. Add a new request. Uh, here's the pull down menu for that. You can choose the internal connections, all your equipment, your basic maintenance of those connections, or that manage broadband services. So I'm just going to do the internal connections. And you can see here I've got a list of all the different kinds of things, cabling, caching, rack, router. Uh, WAP is wireless access point. So I'm going to pick cabling. There we go. I chose cabling as this example. Um, a thousand feet. I don't know if that's enough, I just picked that as a number. And then there is a manufacturer, a huge pull down menu of all these manufacturers. You don't have to pick one if you don't want to, no preference is fine. Um, but if you do, it's gonna say a particular manufacturer or equivalent. You don't wanna limit yourself to just one brand because then if your company doesn't offer that brand, you don't get the E-rate. Um, it won't even let you do not equivalent. So um, that's just to show you that's what will come up. You're still just one entity, but in this case, yes, I do not know how to install internet cabling, so I would like someone to please install it for me. I hit the Add button, just like the first one, and there it is on the Category 2 list. Um, and now I'm going to show you, I went through and added a couple of more, and this is just what it looked like afterwards going through. I said I also want one router and three wireless access points. These are the kind of things I'm going to purchase next year and I want an E-rate discount on. So I just hit that Add New Service Request multiple times and adding all the different things I wanted. So you'll maybe just have to go through this for all the different things that you'll want, either Category 1 or 2, until you've got them all listed out there. Um, now this is a full screen of just showing what you have here all, you know, this is, this is what you'll end up with. You'll see all of your want, category ones that you're asking for, all your category twos. You can confirm, is this everything? It's all there showing me on one screen. If it is, then I save and continue at the bottom. Uh, after that, it asks, do you have a tech person? Do you have a technical contact? Someone that's not you who these companies could potentially um, reach out to to ask more questions. Um, if it's just you, you'd say no. If you have someone else, you could have them, you could have created them a user account if you wanted them to have access to E-Rate, uh, your E-Rate applications. In my case, I did the enter details manually because my tech person, Sue, she doesn't care about applying for E-Rate. She just installs my stuff. <laughs> And she does not need her own account in the Epic system to handle E-Rate, but she will be the person I prefer the companies to call and ask the details about our uh, network closet and whatnot. So I enter her information and save and continue. 
And then do you have any state or local requirements? If this is any bidding requirements that you have um, that your city or your county, if you're county based, um, puts upon you about anybody doing bidding for services to you, you'd need to um, put links to that in here. In Nebraska, at the state level, we do not have any requirements, but you'll need to check your local level and see if there is. And if it is, it'd be a yes, and then there'd be a link, uh, an option to um, give the details about what that is. And now that's all the information for your 470. We now have a review the form option rather than save and continue because we've entered all the information needed. It will then say when it's ready, a task will become available to complete your certification. That's approving and actually submitting the form. Um, and that's in your tasks option in the top there. You can see this screenshot, it just said tasks. But if I go to the next one, there's a little number appears up there in parentheses next to it, showing me how many tasks I have. Um, so you just have to watch your screen. Sometimes it takes three, four, five minutes for it to process through and come up as a task. So just keep an eye on it. Refresh your screen a few times maybe. Um, once you see it there, then you go to the one that says certify the form. And then you'll see here is where you can actually sign off on that I do want to submit. You'll notice here the continue to certification button is grayed out. It's, it's a light blue, not that bright blue like the ones we could click on. It's not live yet because you'll see that box that says by checking this box, I certify the information in the PDF above is correct. We haven't checked that box yet. What it wants you to do is click on this link, download a PDF of your form and double check it. So you want to do that. This is also a way of getting yourself a print copy of the form. So here's the, um, uh, PDF of what I submitted just shows you what you entered scroll down a bit there's your category ones it's very small on the screen but just so you can see there's my category two technical contact all the information save your PDF for your purposes go back check the box if everything's correct if anything's not correct you see there's that back button you can always go back and change things you just go back 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 to the part that you need to fix but if it's all good you check the box and you continue to certification you do not send that is send to someone else in the system, like I was mentioning before, a different person who's authorized to, to certify and submit the form. Um, unless you're in that situation, you would send it to somebody else who has an account in here um, in your organization. Otherwise, you continue to consider it certification because you're the one authorized to do it. It will then confirm this is going to actually go to the, do you actually want to do this? At this point, you can't go back. Um, and this is the certifications. There's a whole bunch. This is all the legalese where you're agreeing to all the legal terminology related to it. And I'm going to zoom in here so you can see all these boxes that you have to check in. If you don't check all these boxes, you won't be able to certify. You'll notice here in the lower right, there is the certify button. Just like before, it's still light blue, not able to be clicked yet. Until we check all these boxes, it won't be live for us to click on. So this is just the, I certify that I'm the one who's allowed to do this, that I'm gonna follow all the rules, that I'll review everything correctly, et cetera, et cetera. Feel free to read it all if you want to. Once you check all of those and hit the certify button because it has become blue, you will get now the, um, the scary legal um, notification. Fault statements in this form may result in civil liability and or criminal prosecution. Don't panic. That's just the legal idea yeah, that it will, if you do anything wrong, basically follow the rules. Don't try and, you know, break any of the E-rate rules. Um, you do have to agree to that if you're going to submit your application. So you say yes, and then you've submitted it. Now, if you want to double check and see, make sure that I do it all right, down at the bottom on your landing page, this is where you can look up any of your forms. And I'm going to zoom in there. You can choose form type and year. Uh, because the last time the Library Commission did this was in 2016, that's my example here. Um, but you choose whatever form you want to look up, what funding year, and then you can see the status on the right there. Um, it is certified, that means it's submitted, all good, it's done. Incomplete, I'm still in the middle of that one. That's one that you'll see, it'll keep popping up in your tasks saying, you know, complete this form, don't, don't you got to do this form. Um, so you know that one's still out there. Um, if you do have things in your tasks that you are not that are not complete, it will the system will email you reminders letting you know uh, you need to submit this form, you need to do this, you need to create this form, and it will get a little confusing because it says create a form, but if that's just their reminder saying don't forget you're in the middle of this one. Lots of people do get confused with this where they think, oh, well, to go in to update a form, I've got to click on that FCC form up at the upper right. Every time you click on that, it creates a new form. 
you always want to go to your tasks to continue a form. But if you've accidentally started new ones and you don't really need them anymore, just go into them, use that discard form button, and get rid of them. Clean it up. That will stop the system from constantly sending you email reminders that you don't need. Um, now, um, from this, when you have looked up your form, the nickname over here, you notice that's blue. It's a hot link you can click on and see the HTML version of the form. So you can see everything on here of what you submitted as well, just like PDF, but in the web version. After you submit this, you will receive a, a receipt notification letter. It's not actually a letter that's mailed to you, even though it's called a letter. It's an email that goes into your news section in your um, Epic account uh, saying it's been received. This is also where you can make any changes. If there is anything that you realize, oh, I made a mistake, I put something in wrong, you can make a fix. Um, this also gives you what's called your allowable contract date. After you do your 470, you have your open to bidding process. You have to have that open for 28 days by FCC rules before you can pick officially who you wanna go with. Even if you're just sticking with your same current provider, nothing's changing, you still have to give anyone else potential chance to reach out to you and, and, and contact you. This is what competitive bidding is all about. And you have to wait 28 days before you can go on to the second form and say who you ended up with. Uh, this is what it looks like in your Epic account. And you can see the very end of that very first paragraph, it says the allowable contract date is, and in this case, it was in April in 2016. Um, so that's the soonest you can do your second step, the 471. Um, okay, we have a question about the receipt notification letter. Will they save the RNL or do we have to save a copy in records of paperwork? Um, it will always be there in your news. You can always go back to historically all the way back to any previous news, um, any previous forms you've done will always be in your Epic account. You can print it out if you want to from here. You can see those links there will give you a copy of it, but it will always be in, in here as well. They have said they will always track everything for us in, in, the, in there. I recommend if you want to making your own copies, uh, you know, they say they will keep everything, but you know, things can break, internet can crash, things like that. You might want to look at something when their system is down for maintenance or whatever, so it doesn't hurt to make a copy. Um, like I said, but I would recommend electronic everything. Just make PDFs, save things, scan things, whatever, and just keep it in a little file, you know, 2020 E-rate, 2019 E-rate. Any other questions about the 470? It's a pretty easy form. The hardest part about the 470 is figuring out what you want. <laughs> and that's the prep work you do beforehand. Or what are we going to ask for a discount on? Now, competitive bidding is what is actually happening after you've submitted your 470. If any, there is competition. <laughs> now, it, as I mentioned earlier, here in Nebraska, half the time there's nobody, there's no competition. You've got one company in town, that's it. You're just going through the E-rate process to make sure you can get your discount, and that's fine. Um, but it is the process that you are formally going through, where you are saying, opening up for bids, saying, we are looking for someone to provide us with internet service. We're looking for someone to sell us a router and install it and whatever. Um, you, as I said, it's 28 days. You have to wait and let companies contact you. They can read what you've posted. They can reach out to you. They might ask questions about what do you need, what are you actually talking about. Um, you can compare all of the offers that you receive, see what people are um, offering to you. After the 28 days are over, that's when you can make the decision and go on to the second form and report to USAC who you've picked. Um, you must select the most cost-effective bid is what E-rate um, States. And I'm going to explain what that means. Uh, first, you do must you must have a fair and open bidding process. I mean, you treat everyone the same. You can't have a company, a vendor, a potential service provider help you fill out your 470. Meaning, you can't go to a company and say, even your current one, saying, "Hey, we're doing E-rate. We want it to be you. We're going to work with you. Tell me what to put on this form so I can, you know, process it through." You can't do that. What you can do is go to them and say, "If I would like to upgrade, maybe to fiber from what you have." Tell me what I might need. You know, so you don't say, in relation to E-rate, I want to do this. You've got to be very specific that you're not talking to them about it because you want to get E-rate, that you're just investigating things like that. You can also just look on their websites, find out what's available. 
but you have to give everyone the same information too. If one vendor contacts you and asks you a question, you have to answer their question about it. You can't not give them information and give someone else you know, preferential information. So you have to treat everyone fairly if you do get contacts. Um, you also must choose what is the most cost-effective bid. Uh, Cost-effective, as I'm sure we've all experienced in our life in general, does not always mean cheapest. Cost-effective, there's other factors you want to take into consideration when you're considering buying something, and that works for E-rate as well. Cost must be your primary factor, the most important thing you look at, but not the only thing. And I have a way here for you to document what you're doing and to compare companies. Uh, this is an example of how you can potentially compare different companies. Uh, you can do whatever works best for you, but this is one way that you can have documented. If multiple companies contact you, it's a good thing to have just in case they or USAC come back later and ask you, why did you pick so-and-so over so-and-so company? This will show what your reasoning was. Uh, price being the most uh, primary factor, and this, this is how it works. You can say, these are all the things that matter to me. Price, um, do I know the, co the company, prior experience? Uh, what do they charge for other things? How will they give me a discount? Are they local? Anything else that might matter to you. Do I know their customer support? Um, what do I know about them? And you assign points that they can earn for each of those things. Price, they have to be able to earn the most points. As you can see here, they can earn 30 points, up to 30 points for having the, what their price is, and then everything else is just less points, adding up to a total of 100. So you can see here, three companies contacted me. And we gave them the vendor two, had the cheapest pricing, um, but then there was all these other factors involved. And in the end, vendor three had more points than anybody else. That is the reason why I went with them because price was the primary factor. They were able to earn the most points there, but there's a lot of our things that matter, other things that mattered to me. And overall, they ended up the most. In this case, what's obvious, what is most likely happening is here is a new company came into town, vendor two, you know nothing about them, no prior experience. So they earned zero points for that. But the other two companies you do know, that's where they earned their points. And the third company was not as cheap as the second company, but that's okay. You do know them, you know what their prices are for other services. Uh, they might have been better local or not. Um, so overall, because they earned the most points in total, that's okay for you to pick them. Even though vendor two was the cheapest, you're perfectly fine going with vendor three. Uh, definitely good to have this, especially because vendor two might come back and be a little upset. They will say, we know we are cheaper than vendor three. Um, they should not have picked them. I want to know what happened. I want to know why they picked them. I think this was wrong. I think something is right. And they may come to you, Seth. They may come to you and question it. If you have this, you can show them why. We don't know you. That's why we didn't give you anything. Um, your reasoning might be, another thing that a lot of libraries have mentioned to me is customer service. We know we've heard about this company and their customer service is horrible. We gave them a zero on customer service. Sorry, you may be the cheapest, but your customer service is not that great. <laughs> um, so this is how you can do a comparison if you need to. Now, what if you have, now this might not actually be, there might not even be a need to do a comp comparison because there isn't any comp competition. For example, what if you have an existing contract with your current service provider? Um, and you you want to just start doing E-rate after you've already signed a contract with them. That's okay. What you do is you do your 470, no problem, just like usual. You wait the 28 days like you always do, but then you take your existing contract, your current what you currently have set up, and that's one of your bids, is considered one of your bids. You, and then if you do get other companies contact you, you take that current situation, compare it to the other ones. If the existing one is the winning bid, based on this, for example, prior experience, they're probably gonna get high numbers because they are your current company, then they win and it's all done, all good, it's now eligible and your current contract can just be used to start getting E-rate discount on even if you've never done it before. You don't have to start wait to start from scratch. If you have a current contract, if you're in the middle of a multi-year contract, it's okay, you just do it this way, make your current contract be one of those bids. Um, what if your city pays for your library's internet? I've had a lot of libraries tell me, well, it doesn't matter. The city pays for it for everyone, so what? I, I don't have anything to get discount on. Actually, you can. 
if you can separate what is the library's part of the internet that the city pays for from all the other departments, you can get a discount on the library's portion. Not on the whole service, everything the city pays for, but at least the part that is used by the library. You may have statistics you can get from the service provider showing who uses what by IP address or computer. You would submit an estimate of this or the actual stats and then only apply for E-rate for the library's part. It takes a little bit of work, a little, you know, knowing the numbers and everything, but your city may, may be happy to say you're going to at least save them, you know, 70, 80 percent on part of their internet bill. So you can use this cost allocation method to get a discount on just what the library uses. What if you only get one bid or you get no bids? That's okay. You do not have to have a competition at all. If you only get one bid and it's cost effective, you can accept it. Uh, especially with your current provider. Just write yourself a little memo or email saying for 2020, only company was this uh, this one, so that's it, in case anyone questions it later. After the 28 days, if you haven't received any, then you can reach out to companies. Before that 28 days, no, you're just sitting back and waiting and letting them come to you. But after that 28 days, if nobody has reached out to you, you can start saying, you know, poking them and say, hey, we're, we're, we're looking for E-rate. Um, definitely a good point at this, uh, good idea at this point, if you're, you're going to be sticking with your current provider, just let them, you know, contact them and just say, are you still going to continue with us? Are you still doing E-rate? Just confirm with them. A little email back and forth maybe so you have that documented that yes, they're going to still be your um, provider and they're, they're still going to um, participate in E-rate for you. So then on or after that date, that 38 days, that's when you can officially close the competitive bidding process. As of 28 days, you can say, we're done, we're not accepting any more bids. You, then you can officially evaluate, choose who you want, sign a contract if necessary, if you need to sign a new document, and then do your 471. Um, you can go longer than that. It doesn't have to be on that date. If you're still waiting to hear from companies, it's just get a, definitely wait those 28 days. Uh, you can put in your in that narrative part of your 470 some specifics about we will only accept uh, bids up to the allowable contract date. Any bids accepted and you know, submitted to us after a certain whatever date we determine you, know, you put it in there will not be accepted. Um, I've had libraries have that situation where they waited the 28 days, they picked their company. They, they decide who they want to go, and then three weeks later, some new company, another company sends them a bid, and they're like, but we already made our decision. That's okay, as long as you document in your 470, that's how the process is going to work. No late submissions. If you didn't meet our deadline that we put on that 470, you're out of luck. Just make sure you put it on there. Uh, your 471 does have to be done also just during what we call the application filing window. And we'll talk about that a certain period of time when you can do your 471. Now, when is your allowable contract date up? It was given to you when you first submitted your 470. But E-rate USAC will also proactively send you an email letting you know. And this is an email actually out to your personal email address, not just within the Epic system where you have to go log in and check. Because you've got an, your email address is your login. They will send an email to you poking you saying, hey, your allowable contract date has been reached. You can now start doing all the other stuff. You can now evaluate everything and do it. So this is great. This is a new thing, part of this new Epic system that they will actually reach out to you and nudge you to make sure you're ready to go on to the next step so you don't miss it. Any questions about the 470 or competitive bidding? 95% of the time, I'm just guessing, here in Nebraska, there is no competition to worry about. You put it out there, it's going to be your current provider, and you just can continue with them. But it may come up, so now you know how it will all work. All right. Oh, and that a level contract date email will also appear in your Epic account for you as well. So the second form in the E-rate process is your 471. This is where you tell USAC who you decided to go with. Um, you must do this every year. Um, you let them know who you picked, what service providers, um, your discount calculation appears in there. Um, 
so it says, remind me again, where do we put the deadline so vendors know they can't submit? Uh, when you're doing your 470, there was that free text box where it was called a narrative. It's, it's right underneath where you put in the specific uh, um, service you're looking for that you can type in anything that's where you can put in and explain what, how it's all going to work you could also write up a little rfp and attach it during that rfp process but for something simple like this that box would serve that purpose so it's the narrative in, in your 470. so the 471 uh, this point you can communicate with your provider. They actually recommend that you do um, because at this point is when you need to find out exactly what are we going to be getting, what speed is it going to be, what is our connection, what brands, what's all going to end up being, what the price is going to be. Um, so this is when you would definitely reach out to them um, and to let them know how you want to get your discount money that we'll get into too. So you do this after the 28 days have passed after your allowable contract date is reached, after you sign a document, if you need to sign a new contract or, or something legally binding, and during the application filing window. Uh, the application filing window is something that happens generally during the spring. Uh, 471s are only available during the short period of time. It's usually about two to three months. And that's the only time when the form is live when you can submit it. Your 470, you can submit pretty much any time during the year, but they have a certain time. They always announce when these dates are. They vary every year the beginning, opening and closing date of the window. Hopefully in December sometime, they'll announce the actual dates. So you'll have to wait till that window is open to do your 471. If you try now, it won't even work because it's not working and it's not available. Uh, when the dates are announced, I push it out on our mailing lists on our, on our website. Um, it'll be everywhere on our pages, it'll be everywhere on the E-Rate web pages. Uh, because it's not available exactly right now, I won't, I'm not going to go through the entire 470 here like I just did the 47, or the entire 471 like I just did the 470, um, but I'm going to give you some specific details about it. Get into the 471, it's in the upper right hand corner there. Uh, starts off the same way. I can show you this. This is the start page as you can see for the 2019 form. You enter a nickname just like the first one and then you go through it. Um, I don't, as like I said, I don't have the actual screenshots going through it, but I will tell you about how it works with the 471. It's a few different things with the 471 uh, than the 470. First, you do need to file a separate one for each SERP category of service, category one, category two. For the 470, you could have both of those on one form. If you're doing both category one and category two, you have to submit two form 471s, one for all the category one things and one for all the category two. There's also a two-step process for entering all the information about what you're getting. There's first you create the request itself. The funding request is what they call it, whatever the thing is you're getting. My monthly internet, I'm buying a router, a wireless access point, whatever. Then there's the line item information about that item you're getting, which is the money. Telling how much it's going to cost, is it a monthly cost, is it a one-time cost. This is where some people kind of lose it in the process. They create the refunding request saying what they're getting and then they don't go deeper into the second step of how much did it cost. If you haven't entered any money information into a 471, a dollar amount of what's going to cost, you're not, you haven't finished it yet. You're, you've got to do something. It's going to come up with an error message anyways and let you know. Most likely that's a thing that you've forgotten to do. Um, after you enter all of that information, it's got certifications, just like the 470. They're very similar once you get into them. Um, in this case, in the 470, you're saying, here's what I'm looking for. The 471, here's what I ended up with. Uh, you'll also get a receipt now letter from about that, same kind of thing. You can use it to make changes if you want to. Um, if you realize something that needs to be changed money-wise, you can request reductions in your funding, but not an increase if you need to make a change. So if you said it's a cost, you got to make sure you've done the right amount there. Um, receipt acknowledgement letter goes right into your E-rate um, in your EPIC system, just like your 470 does. Um, so the 471 is pretty easy. It's just confirming what you ended up with. The hardest part with that is going back and forth with your provider about what you're going to actually get. And that, once again, is prep work before going in and doing the form. Any questions about the 471? No? All right. So once you've... So once you've submitted your 471, the second form, this is where you sit back and wait. This is when E-Rate e USAC will start reviewing your application. Uh, they're going to look at what you asked for. 
um, look at your provider, make sure that you did everything correctly. Uh, this may they may ask you questions at this point. This may they may, they may reach out to you. You're going to get an email to your email address. You don't have to go into Epic and check to see if they're asking. They will send you something proactively. Um, they may need just to clarify things. They may need you to uh, provide a bill, a copy of documentation, whatever. The part of E-Rate USAC that does this is called PIA, Program Integrity Assurance. Uh, they will reach out to you. They generally give you 15 days to respond to them. You can ask for extensions if you need. Um, and they will give you a link in this email of where you can go into in your E-Rate account, um, your Epic account, to respond to their, their questions. You don't email back with them. They want everything in Epic, so it's all documented all in the system. So you'll go into there and you respond to their questions. I highly recommend um, if you do get one of these and you're any bit confused here in Nebraska, contact me. I'm your state E-Rate coordinator in Nebraska. I will help you figure out and answer the questions. I can translate what I call E-Rate ease. <laughs> they have their own language. Sometimes they uh, ask things in a very convoluted way and I can read it and figure out exactly what they need from you and get the answer to them. Um, each state in the, in the country, each has its own state E-rate coordinator. So if you're watching this and you're not from Nebraska, don't call me. <laughs> uh, contact your state library and they should know who your state E-rate coordinator is that you can reach out to. Uh, so once you've gone back and forth with them and they've asked all the questions they want, they will respond to you with your their decision letter. Uh, it's called a funding commitment decision letter. Once again, it's not an actual letter emailed to you. It's sent to you in your Epic account. Um, it lets you know if you've been funded or not, if they reduce the funding, um, if you have done more than one form 470, like for category one and category two, they may send you, they may separate that out just separately in their evaluation. So you'll get a form that's, you'll get a decision letter that's just about your category one, but not your category two yet. Pay attention to it, read it, see what it's for. Um, if you disagree, you can do an appeal. You can say, I want to, you know, I think it should have been approved and we can go through all that. You will receive this funding commitment decision letter as an email with a PDF attachment. So um, this is once again the thing they proactively reach out to you so you'll know. Funding commitment decision letter available for so-and-so library. So there's a PDF attached to it and there's a spreadsheet attached showing the breakdown of how it was done as well. Um, and this tells you what your next steps are. Uh, this is the funding commitment letter, the PDF that's attached. This is an example from a, a, a school district so it's it's not for one of our libraries, but same format. Tell you what's committed, what your next steps are, what the next thing you have to do is going to do your next step in the process. Um, then there's going to be another page that shows the specifically each funding request that you asked for and how much it was for, and then a more detailed page with all the details. So everything is on there, everything you need to know about your uh, funding commitment and what they have um, approved for you. You can also view this in your Epic account if you want to. Um, the notifications there, you just choose funding commitment decision letter and a funding year, whatever the funding year you're, you're going for, and it pops up, you view it, and then it comes an item in your news item. You can then look at that same document, the same PDF, but in your um, Epic account, if you like. Now, in the next steps of this letter, you'll see it says, um, it tells you exactly what you need to do next. Work with your service provider to do your bills, review your SIPR requirements, and file the Form 486 it's down there at the bottom. Um, decide how you're going to do your 472 or 471, your invoicing. So it tells you all your next steps on there. The next step in E-Rate is the Form 486. This is the form where you tell E-Rate that you want your money. Uh, this is another place where some people lose it in the process, um, as in they think they're done, but they're not. <laughs> You've received a funding commitment decision letter. It says, you have been funded for E-rate, and you say, yes, I did it. I'm good. Sit back and relax. No, that's not actually saying, here's the money. That's saying we've set it. That what it's saying is, we've set aside the money for your library. Please let us know if you actually want this money that we've set aside for you. Now, why would you not want it? That seems kind of crazy. I asked for it. Why would I not want it? Your situation may have changed. Uh, this review process can take months. Um, it necessarily doesn't come to you before even the funding year starts in July of 2020. Some libraries are still waiting in August, September, October, and still haven't heard yet. 
your situation may change. If you were doing a big construction project, maybe things have been delayed or canceled or something has come up. There's all sorts of reasons why you might, you know, your service provider has decided um, out of the goodness of their heart to give you free internet, as many of our cities here in Nebraska do. So E-rate is a moot point. There's all sorts of reasons why you might not want it. So you do have to confirm with a 486. So this is officially notifying them that services have started and you um, say, yes, we're in compliance with SIPA. What's great about the 486 is you almost literally have nothing that you have to enter. All the information is already in your Epic account because you entered it in your 470, USAC approved it, and now all you do in your 486 is check some boxes and confirm, yep, these are all still the same things. It is the easiest, shortest, quickest form of the whole process, and it's the one that many people forget to do because that funding commitment letter is a great thing to get and you get you forget that you still have something left. So to get your 46, it's up there in the upper right menu as well. Uh, same thing, you give it a nickname, but then you choose the funding year that you are um, approving for, um, accepting. And when you do that, and on the next screen, it just shows you automatically, here are all of the funding requests you put in. Would, do you want them all? Um, and to, to choose them all, you just check in the boxes in front of the ones you want. Um, for some reason, you might not want some, like I said, if situations change. You check them all, you add them to, um, it says add all FRNs, you check some, add the ones you've checked, they bump down to this, they appear in the second selected section, so you check them in the top boxes, they pop down in the bottom, and that's how you are approving that you want them. And then you just go through the rest of the form. You don't have to enter any of this information. Um, it's already all in there, the FRN numbers, the application numbers, the nicknames, none of this you have to enter, the costs or anything. All you have to enter is what funding year am I talking about? Poof, this is all the things for that funding year. Easy peasy. You then have your certifications. What do you have to do here? Um, on the first page of certifications, there is early filing and SIPA waiver. Early filing, if you read it, it says, is this for services starting on or before July 31st of the funding year? Generally, things are, if it's your monthly bill, it's going to have started in July, so yes. If it's not, if it's maybe for some construction not being done later, then you wouldn't check that. SIPA waiver is only if you're requesting a waiver of requirements. Um, if you are brand new to doing SIPA, brand new to doing filtering, you hadn't done it before, but you want to start doing it so you can get E-rate, they actually give you three years to become compliant. They know it takes trouble time, they know it can be time, you know, take time to pick something and decide on what you're going to get and get everything installed. So you can say, I'm in the second year of working on this. You would check that. If not, don't check that box. If you are already have your filters in, you don't need a waiver for them. You continue on to the next page where it's the rest of the certifications. This is fewer than the other ones, but a couple of just legalese, I agree to follow all the rules. But then there's the SIPA certifications. Pick one of these three, depending on your situation. The first one is, I am in compliance. The second one is, um, I am undertaking actions. I'm working on becoming compliant. And the third one is I am not in compliance because it doesn't apply because I'm only applying for telecommunications, telephone service. Now, I told you way in the beginning of this that you can no longer receive discounts uh, at rate on phone voice services. But there are some people still working on previous years where that does still apply and they need this form to work for that purpose. So that is still an option. Don't pick that one if you're doing anything now forward because it's not available. Um, you're either totally in compliance, choice one, or you're working on being compliant because you're new to filtering, choice two. Most of you doing it hope you, you're in compliance. Then you go to preview the form and um, see what it looks like, just like the 470. I showed you all the screenshots of that. It works all the same way. Look at it. It's all good. And then you've submitted it. Uh, there is a deadline to submitting for submitting your 46, um, 120 days after your service start date, which is um, July 1st, generally speaking, or after the date of the funding commitment letter for those ones that come after July. Um, if July 1st, if you've gotten your funding commitment letter before July 1st, October, end of October is going to be the deadline. If it's after that, it's going to be at some dates forward working, you know, 120 days from there. Uh, E-rate will start nudging you about this right at the end of October. 
here I nudge our, my libraries proactively. I can I start looking in the beginning of October, libraries who have not done this yet, and I will send you out a form, uh, an email saying, hey, you haven't done this yet for this year. If you want your money, you need to make sure you get this form done, and I will nudge you to make sure you get it done. When you submit it, you will get an email saying that it has been submitted, you and the service provider, so that they know as well that, yes, you've done this, and now you can start working on getting your money. Um, that letter will also appear in your E-Rate um, Epic account in your news item, so you have a copy of it there as well. Now, any questions up to now? Um, we have a few more slides to get through. Um, we had a lot of good questions today, so we're running a little later than I wanted to on the timing of this. I apologize for that, but I wanted to make sure I answered all your questions. Um, so we're probably going to run 15, 20 minutes over the official stop time of 4 p.m. Uh, so I can get through everything for, um, for you guys and for the recording. Please do stick around if you are able to stick around for the whole thing. If you have to leave because you're only allotted till 4 p.m. Central Time, we are recording the whole thing. You can always come back and watch it later. Does anybody have any questions right now that you want to ask me before I move on to the last couple of steps of E-Rate? Go ahead and type into your questions section. Yeah. All right, we will go on then. Awesome. All right. So after you've done your 46, the last form in the process is the 474 or the 472, depending on your situation. This is what USAC calls invoicing. This is where you're choosing how you're going to receive your funding. You have a choice of how you want to receive your money. Um, if you want to receive a discount on your bills, where you um, automatically just get the money, you just pay a, a, cheap, a lower bill, um, you, your service provider submits a what they call the service provider invoice form, the SPY, uh, form 474. They submit that, your bills start coming automatically discounted. If that's your situation, you're done after the 46. You only have to do those first three forms. However, your other choice is paying your bills in full and then being reimbursed after the fact. That In that case, you would submit the bare form, Build Entity Applicant Reimbursement Form 472. Uh, this would be for some companies don't do discounts, so you have to wait and pay the whole year. Things like Category 2 where you pay it outright and then you need to ask for a reimbursement after the fact. So the SPY form is filled by your service provider. Uh, the bare form is submitted by you after you've paid the bills so you can get your money back. Uh, there is, the service provider just does it whenever they want to. Uh, as long as they're pay, discounting your bills, you're fine. It, whether they've submitted it or not is not your um, responsibility. It's not up to you to make sure they do that. They are discounting you and then USAC is giving them back the money. Your service provider always gets paid in full. Um, it's just part from you, part from E-Rate. In that, in that case, when they're discounting your bills. Um, don't worry about them doing it on their side. As long as they've agreed to discount you and you check your bills that are coming and they're having that discount applied, you're good to go. Uh, the bare form, you're paying in full and then you're having USAC reimburse you for the extra you've paid, the discounts you're due. That also has a deadline to submit those. That's um, another 120 days after the last service dates, so the end of a funding year, June 30th. You have 120 days after that to submit a bear form for all that previous year's uh, charges. That also falls near the end of October. Also, if you are in Nebraska Library, and I, I also check up on that, and if you have not submitted a, a bear form, I will nudge you and say, hey, I, I want to make sure you're going to get your money. If I see that neither a bear or a spy has been submitted, I will reach out to you and poke you to double check on that and make sure the funding is coming through correctly. Now, uh, as of 2016, this is all done, the bare form. So if you are paying, getting reimbursed, uh, it's all direct deposit. I mentioned that earlier. Electronic bank transfers, direct deposit. Um, USAC does not issue checks. It used to go, it used to feed through your service provider and none of that anymore. Because they have this new way of doing it, there's one new form that you have to submit, the 498. This is where you give USAC the banking info, where you want the, the um, payments to be submitted. Um, you only have to do this once. Once you get this information in there, um, as long as your bank account info doesn't change, then they'll just keep depositing it into that every year when you're doing your E-rate. Um, it's your usual basic inf banking info. You will need a federal ID number. This is used for payroll, so you should have that or your city will have that. 
Something new you have to have is a, they call a Dunn's number, a Dunn and Bradstreet Street number, another one of those if you do business with you, um, the government, you have to have this number. Um, they also have a website to see if you have one or if you need to apply for one. Um, so you can do that and get that very quickly as well to submit this form. This is in a different place than your other E-rate forms because it's only a one-time thing. You don't have to do it regularly every year like all the other forms. So it's not that upper right corner. Instead, to get to this one, you click on your name where it says welcome, so and so library. And then you have related actions on your submenu there. And on here, it looks way down in the middle. It's about the middle of the whole list of things. There's a create form uh, 498. Uh, same kind of thing. You enter a nickname. There's a lot of similar things on all these forms. And then it starts asking for your, uh, you know, your routing number, your bank account number. I'm not going to go through screenshots with this because I'm not going to you know, show you the Library Commission's banking information. But you enter all of this information in here, all your usual banking information and all the code numbers they need. They will respond with an email saying we received your request and you need to submit your proof. Uh, just like with doing direct deposit for anything, um, you have to give either a voided check or a copy of a bank statement to them. This is submitted in a separate place from USAC, from EPIC. Uh, they do keep it for security reasons in a whole separate website. It's not in that EPIC account. They'll send you this email. You use the link in this email to get to the place where you upload the documentation. Um, when the when it is all um, uploaded and if, and done and they have approved it and everything, you'll get an email letting you know that your 498 ID has been approved, and then you can go on to do the actual bare form itself, the form where you're requesting the reimbursement. So until you have this 498 done, you can't even do the bear form. It won't let it work for you. You have to have this done and it's there um, in your account automatically to let you then do the request for your reimbursement. Now, the bear form is the one basic E-rate form that is not yet in EPIC. Don't know, not really any good reason why yet. They just haven't done it yet. It's in the, using the, what they call, they lovingly call the legacy online system. So this is a slightly different way to get to it. You click on the forms link over there on the EUSAC main website, and there is a link to file online the form 472, your bear. It has this kind of a colorful interface uh, where you put in your BEN number, that build entity number I mentioned for your library. And this is a PIN. This is a different um, login than your Epic account. It's something totally different. Uh, previous, This is the previous incarnation of um, online forms for E-rate. You were, if you did the E-rate this way before, you were assigned a PIN number. Uh, something was mailed to you on a postcard, mishmash. This is ones they did assign to you. Mishmash of numbers and letters didn't make any sense. That's what you use here. If you don't have one of those, because either you've lost it or don't remember it, or you're brand new to E-rate, same deal. Contact their customer service. They will issue one to you so that you can do this if you need to. Uh, once you go in there to submit it, it is very similar to your 486 where all your information is already in there. You've just got to pick the ones you want to get the reimbursement for. Not a lot of um, proactively having to enter things, just selecting the ones that you want the discounts for. Um, oh, question. If we don't plan to submit a bare form, we do not have to do the form 498, correct? Correct, that is correct. Yes, the 498 is only required if you're gonna be doing bears, which means getting paying bills in full and getting a reimbursement after the fact. If you are full on just getting discounts from your service provider and that's how it's gonna continue, you're just doing your same old, same thing you've done for years and years, all this that I've just talked about, the 498 and the bear doesn't apply to you at all. You don't have to do it, it's not a requirement at all. Sometime down the, in the future, if you start doing those category twos where you're buying things and getting reimbursed after the fact, then you'd you know, think about it. But for your standard monthly internet, nope. You do not have to do a 498. So you will receive a bear notification letter that is sent to you and the service provider just to let them know that it's been processed. And you'll start getting quarterly reports, um, whether you've done um, bears for getting reimbursements after the fact or you're getting discounts on your bills. Um, USAC will send you, um, but here's where they'll let you know a bear has been submitted. You get an email. Um, but then you'll get these reports uh, uh, either coming in email or in the mail. It's kind of varying where it will show you uh, that it's been a bear. It's been a service, a spy form. Here's the discount. 
if you're getting discounts on your bills, uh, compare this to your bills. This is the amount of money that, that USAC has actually sent your provider. Make sure they're passing on that same amount to you. If they're saying we've deposited this into your bank account, don't check your bank account. Just make sure the right amount went into there. So they will send you these notifications to let you know um, what's been um, going on. And after you've done that part, you're, you're invoicing of deciding you know, of either your service provider gives you discounts, so you're done way back at the 498, or you're doing your reimbursements after the fact, and you've gone through and done your bear. You are done with all of your E-rate. Um, now, that sounds like a lot of things to do, um, and it is, but all of these forms happen at different times throughout the year. There is a timeline of them. On our use on our E-rate website, I have a timeline. I show you different times of year um, when all these different things happen. So it's not all at once. It's gradually reminders are sent to you. There's usually a few months between each step in the process. Uh, so it is an ongoing process, but it is not an all at once process. And here in Nebraska, I do keep an eye on what you guys do. I will nudge you to do the next step. If you have any questions or concerns or confusion or you're not sure where you're at in the process, email me, call me. That's what I'm here for. I am your person to make sure you get this money. Um, with E-Rate, all of this money is already out there. It is set aside for you. It is available for our libraries. You just need to go and ask for it. Um, it has been designated for us. It's set aside. You know, all that money has been collected by those fees that we've all been paying. It just needs, we need someone to give it to. Um, it is the federal government, though, so there's, you know, steps and bureaucracy to go through. Um, a few other useful things here. I mentioned sign up for those news briefs. That's a weekly thing that they'll just send you an email. If it doesn't have anything useful to you, yeah, delete it. There is, I do have on their E-Rate website, there is a, uh, a, a flow chart of the application process. So you can use that to follow through. Um, E-Rate Central and Funds for Learning, I mentioned cons consulta uh, consultants, you can pay to do your E-Rate for you. Both of those have those kind of services, things you can pay for, but they both have really good um, resources and references and information to help you in the process to user guides and things. I look at them sometimes for when I need help to answer a question. So definitely, um, if you want to, you can look at them. Uh, this is that E-Rate, um, their customer service number that I've been talking about. They call their customer service CSB, Client Service Bureau. That you, if you anything I said, contact them. That's the number. Um, I highly recommend their online learning library as well. They have put together, in the last couple of years, they started doing a lot of little videos, five, six minutes long, about different parts of the forms, different processes, information about different things that can just show you with screenshots and live things about what, um, how to do all the different processes. Um, I use them myself to remember, did they change where you click for something or what is the steps for this one now? So I use them a lot. Highly recommend using them to remind yourself on um, how to refresh yourself on how to do some of these things. And then also me. I am, as I said, the state E-rate coordinator for public libraries in Nebraska. Um, any questions you have, 800 number hit there, my email address, that is the website for um, that I have here in Nebraska for our E-rate um, site. It has all sorts of information, links to things um, that can help you as well. Uh, so um, if you are not in Nebraska, look to your state library, ask them. They should know who your state E-rate coordinator is um, that can help you in your states. So what other questions, last questions do you have here? We're only actually about 10 minutes over. That's I went a little faster than I expected. That's great. So do you have any other questions you want to ask about E-rate? Um, anything you need clarification on? Um, anything I didn't cover that you were wondering about that you want to ask me about? Um, go ahead and type it into your questions section. We will, I will um, stay here and answer questions as long as you guys have them. And if you don't have any questions now, um, call, email me uh, whenever you do. Um, and I can help you get through things. So I'll, I'll wait here and see if anybody has any questions. Uh, we are recording the session too, as I said. So um, I will have this posted up within a week or so probably. Uh, so you'll, I'll let everyone know who's attended today or registered for today's uh, workshop when the recording is available. So if there's anything you ever wanna go back and watch again, or if you have any other staff or colleagues that you want to have uh, watch the recording afterwards, you'll be able to send it to them um, and they can watch it um, as well. So. 
I'm gonna wait and see if there's any other questions. Like I said, I can't see if you're typing, so if you are typing something long, I'm not sure. I'm gonna wait and see if anything does come up before I totally wrap things up for today. Um, I hope this was useful to everybody. Um, ah, okay, here's a good question. I, I did, you're right. Uh, you referred to directors throughout the webinar. Can the assistant director do the E-rate? Um, actually, anyone who you designate can be your official person allowed to do E-rate. There is no requirement from um, USAC or from us about who is allowed to do E-rate. It's up to you at your library to decide who you're gonna put in charge of it. Uh, if it's a director, assistant director, your IT person, who you just say, you know what, it's all IT related, you take, you, you handle this for me. Um, you can decide yourself who you want to be um, in charge of it. Okay, uh, here's another question. I only have one service provider that works in my area. They have changed how they build their internet service. They used to have packages for certain prices. Now they charge by the amount of data that you use. How do I fill out Form 470 without a price? Okay, um, well, Form 470, the first form, you don't put a price in. That the four, I think you're probably talking about the 471. Uh, the 470 is for just what you're asking for. The 471 is a price. Um, you, they charge the amount of data. So after you, so it's, Whatever you use, they then bill you for after the fact. Is that what you're saying? So you don't know what it's going to cost until they, okay. You, they, yes, okay. So you don't know what it's going to actually cost. Uh, there should be some sort of a calculation of like an estimate of what they can do. You can also base it on a current bill. Like if you have something, what are we paying today? You can put that in as what it's going to be. Uh, the way E-rate works is it's not, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a percentage you know, so your discount is 60% off whatever you're paying. You tell them what it's gonna be, but then it's actually based on the actual bill that you get. So your service provider, whatever they bill you, they'll have to give you 60% off of that if that's your discount rate. Whether it you know was a, a big month or a small month of usage, it's still 60% off of whatever you paid, no matter um, what the actual cost was. So on your E-rate application for 471, I'd say do a estimate, uh, you know, put in an amount of one of your higher bills so that it, you know, they have enough money set aside for your library. Uh, but it, um, it should be okay with that because as long as, if they're still doing discounts on your bills, it would be the, like I said, percentage. If it's a, if you do a reimbursement after the fact where you pay the bill in full, you're just going to say, I paid this much and E-rate will give you back 60% of whatever you paid at the end of the year. So either way, it should work, even though they've changed how they are billing you out. You're welcome. Yeah. I've heard that some, this is a company that is in many of our um, libraries are having the same situation that it's confusing, but you just have to kind of work it that way. It may be a time to potentially switch to doing the bear, doing the I'll pay it in full and get reimbursement afterwards rather than trying to figure out, well, I don't know what it's going to be every month because it's going to be so varying. Just pay it all and in the end say to USAC, I paid this much, they'll pay you back the 60% or whatever your discount is. All right, any other questions? We're almost at 4.15 here, about 15 minutes over. I so don't wanna run much longer for anybody who's um, attending or watching the recording later. So if you don't have any desperate, urgent questions now, I think I will wrap it up for this afternoon. Thank you everybody for attending. Um, I hope it was useful and I will be sending you out the information about the recording when it's available, like I said, in about a week or so when I get everything edited and processed for you. All right, thank you very much and good luck with your E-rate.